In this course, I'm going to be teaching you everything you need to know to get started writing programs in Ruby. Now, Ruby is an extremely popular programming language, and it's also the programming language behind one of the most popular web development frameworks called Ruby on Rails. So if you're somebody who's looking to get into Ruby on Rails or you just want to learn more about Ruby, you've come to the right place. In this course, I'm going to be showing you everything you need to know to get started. So we're going to start off with the basics like installing Ruby, getting Ruby set up with a text editor and executing your first Ruby program. And we're going to look at, you know, some of the bare basics, things like variables. We're going to look at dealing with different types of data, storing data. We're going to learn things like if statements and loops. And then we're going to get into more advanced stuff. So we're going to talk about the ins and outs of object oriented programming. We're going to talk about things like classes and objects. And all throughout this course, we're going to be using real world examples. So I'm going to be showing you guys different, you know, mini applications that you can build. We're going to build a couple different games. We'll build like a calculator. We can do all sorts of stuff. So not only are we going to be learning Ruby, but I'm going to be showing you guys how to apply it in a bunch of different situations. So I'm excited for you guys to come along in this course. I'm covering just about every major topic in Ruby. So by the end of the course, you should have a pretty solid understanding of what this language is about, what it can do and what you can do with it. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to install Ruby on Windows. It's actually a pretty easy process. Essentially, all we have to do is use a Ruby installer that we can download from like Ruby's official website. And it'll basically walk us through all the installation instructions. So I'm over here on this website. It's rubyinstaller.org forward slash downloads. And this has basically a Windows downloader that we can use. So you'll see down here, there's a bunch of different options. I'm going to be installing uh, the latest version at the current time, which is Ruby 2.4. Um, just a quick disclaimer, the instructions in this video aren't going to work for Ruby versions below 2.4. So below 2.4, there's actually a different way that you can install it. But after 2.4 and above, then you can follow these instructions. So I'm just going to click this and it should start downloading. When the download has finished, now all we have to do is run that program. So I'm going to go over to my downloads folder and you'll see we have this Ruby installer. Let's double click that and it should open up a window that we can work with. All right, so I'm just going to click through all the options on this window. I'll accept the license. And now Ruby should start installing on our computer. All right, when the installer finishes running, all we have to do now is install one more thing. So you'll see over here, there's a checkbox. It says run RIDK install. You want to make sure this is checked and I'm just going to click finish. So this should actually open up another window here. It's just, it says Ruby installer two. And you'll see over here that there's three options. So the first one says MSYS2 base installation. The second one says system update. And then here it says MSYS2 MINGW development tool chain. Just for the purposes of being thorough, we're going to go ahead and install MSYS2 and the MINGW development tool chain. Um, and I found doing this, it's best to just enter all of these options in order. Um, sometimes when you enter just three, then you get an error because certain things aren't updated. So I'm going to go ahead and enter in one. And then after that's done two and then three. And if we do that, then everything should be able to be downloaded correctly. So I'm just going to click one and we'll go ahead and run this. When that's done running, then we can just click two and we'll run that. And this is going to go ahead and update everything that we just installed. And finally, I just want to click this third option. So I'm going to type in three and we'll run that. All right. Once you've run all three of those installers, then we're officially done with installing Ruby on our computer. The last thing I want to do is just check to make sure that everything got installed correctly. So I'm going to go down here and inside of my search bar, I'm just going to type in CMD. So I'm just going to type CMD and this option for the command prompt should come up. So you just want to click that. The command prompt is basically just a way that we can interact with the computer by giving it text commands. And we can go inside here to check to see what version of Ruby we have installed. So essentially what I want to do is just type in Ruby hyphen V. And when I click enter, this should tell me the version of Ruby that I currently have on my computer. So as long as you're getting a version with the Ruby hyphen V command, then you have Ruby installed on your computer and you're ready to start writing some awesome programs. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk to you about installing Ruby on OS X. 
Now, one of the great things about OS X is it actually comes pre-installed with Ruby. So basically you don't actually need to install it. You should just already have it. But I just wanted to talk about in this video, like how we can check to make sure that we have Ruby. And then I'll also talk a little bit about updating the version of Ruby that you have on your computer. So first thing I wanna do is come up here to the search bar and I'm just gonna type in terminal. And basically this will open up the terminal. And the terminal is essentially just a program that allows us to interact with the computer, but using text commands. So inside the terminal, I just wanna check to make sure that everything is installed with Ruby. So I'm just gonna type out Ruby hyphen V. And this should spit out a version number of Ruby. In my case, I have Ruby version 2.4.2. .2. So as long as you're getting a Ruby version number that's getting printed out onto the screen, then you're good to go. And for the most part, if you're running OS X, you should have some version of Ruby installed on your computer. If you'd like to update this version though, for example, if you have maybe an outdated version of Ruby, I would recommend using a program called the Ruby version manager. And I'm not gonna get too into using the Ruby version manager here, but I just wanted to bring it up so that if you are running an outdated version of Ruby, then you'll know kind of what to look for in order to update it. So something called the Ruby version manager, and it's basically a program that you can use to update the current version of Ruby that you have on your computer. So if you're trying to update your current version of Ruby, then use the Ruby version manager, but otherwise you can basically just use whatever Ruby version that you have installed on OS X in order to follow along with this course. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about getting a text editor for Ruby. And then we're also going to look at how we can write our first Ruby program and run our Ruby programs from the text editor that we download. And one of the cool things about Ruby is you can basically write Ruby code in any text editor you want. So you could use something simple like Notepad or text edit, or you could use like a dedicated environment that was built just for writing Ruby. In our purposes for this course, I'm gonna be using a special text editor called Atom. And this is basically a, a text editor, but it's been designed to support Ruby. And so it's gonna be an awesome environment where we can write our Ruby code. So I'm gonna show you guys how to install Atom. We're gonna talk about setting it up and getting it ready to go. But just a quick disclaimer, like you don't have to use Atom if you don't want. That's what I'm gonna be using for this course. But like I said, you can basically use any text editor that you want to write your Ruby programs. So let's go ahead and install Atom. I'm gonna come down here to my web browser and up here in the URL bar, I just wanna type in atom.io. And this is the official website for the Atom text editor. What this should do is it should bring you to a page for your operating system. So in my case, I'm on a Mac, so it gives me this download for Mac option. If you're on a Windows machine, then it'll give you a download for Windows option. I'm just gonna click this and we'll go ahead and download Atom. When Atom has finished downloading, I'm just gonna go into my downloads folder and I'll just go ahead and double click on this atommac.zip file. And if you're on Windows, you might have to go through an installer process. If you're on Mac though, now you basically have Atom over here. So you just move it into your applications folder and you'll be able to start using it. So I already have Atom installed on my computer, so I'm gonna go ahead and open it up. And once we have Atom open, there's a bunch of different stuff that we can do. Um, one thing you might wanna do when you first get into Atom is go down here into preferences or settings. And over here, you can configure a bunch of stuff. So you'll see over here on the side, we have an option for like editor. Um, you can also configure like a theme. So, you know, you could change like what the text editor is gonna look like. Um, you, you can do a bunch of stuff over here just to kind of configure Atom to your liking. Uh, in order to be running Ruby programs on here, we're actually gonna have to install one thing, which is a package. So over here on the settings page, I'm just gonna go over here to this install button. And inside of here, we wanna search for a program. It's just gonna be called Atom hyphen runner. And essentially what this plugin is gonna allow us to do is it's gonna allow us to run our Ruby scripts or our Ruby programs from inside Atom. It's gonna make it really easy for us to do this. So you'll see right here, it's just Atom runner. And I've actually already installed it, but over here there should be an install button just like you see down here. So click the install button on Atom runner. And once that's installed, then we have everything we need to start programming Ruby from inside here. So 
Now that we have Atom Runner installed, I'm gonna show you guys how to set up your first Ruby file. So the first thing I'm gonna do is come over here to file and I'm actually gonna add a project folder. So I'm just gonna click add project folder and I'm just gonna add my documents folder because this is the folder that I'm gonna be working with throughout the course. And I'll just click open. So you'll see over here now we have this little like file explorer window. So that can actually be pretty useful just so we can see like what the different files are that we're working with. So inside this documents folder, I'm actually just gonna click right click and I'm gonna say new file. And I'm gonna go ahead and create a new file and I'm just gonna call this file draft.rb. So whenever we're creating a Ruby file, we wanna use this .rb extension. And that's basically gonna tell our computer that this is gonna be a Ruby program. And you can name it whatever you want. I'm just naming it draft. So I'm gonna click enter, and now we have our first Ruby file up and running. So what I wanna do now is just write a simple line of Ruby code inside of here. We'll test it out, we'll make sure everything's working, and that way we know we have our environment set up to go for the rest of the course. So over here, I'm just gonna type print, and I'm gonna type in open and closed quotation marks, and I'm just gonna type hello world. And I'm just gonna go ahead and save that. So just print this out. And basically what this does is it just prints a line of text out onto the screen. So now what we wanna do is use that Atom Runner plugin. So remember, we installed that Atom Runner plugin before, and now I can actually use that to execute this Ruby code. So I'm just gonna click Control and R. So Control R, and you'll see this is gonna go ahead and run our program. So down here at the bottom of the screen, I actually have this little output window. And you'll see down here that it's printed out, hello world. So it's gone ahead and printed out, hello world onto the screen. So as long as that's working, as long as the control R was able to run that Atom Runner package and we were able to execute the Ruby code, then everything's set up. We're ready to start going in this course. We're ready to start writing some awesome Ruby code. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about the basics of Ruby programs. So we're gonna write a very simple Ruby program. We're gonna talk about how those programs get executed, the order in which the instructions in those programs get executed. We're also gonna talk about different ways that we can print things out onto the screen. So this is gonna be a pretty awesome tutorial. I'm really excited. First thing I wanna show you guys is how to print something out onto the screen. So you'll notice over here, I have my little Atom Runner output window. And in the last tutorial, we talked about setting up this basic environment. So what I wanna do is show you guys how to print something out onto this little console window over here. So all we have to do to print something out is just type print a space. And then if you wanna print out like plain text, we can just make an open and close quotation marks and we can put any text we want. So I could put like Draft Academy here. And now when I run this program by clicking Control R, you'll see that Draft Academy gets printed out onto the screen over here. There's also another way that we can print something out onto the screen. So in addition to just saying print, I could also say puts. And puts basically works the same way as prints. It's gonna take whatever we put inside of these quotation marks and it's gonna print it out onto the screen. So for example, I could type my name like Mike, and now this is gonna get printed out onto the screen over here. Now you'll notice that Draft Academy and Mike are getting printed out right next to each other. And this actually brings me to the first thing I wanna talk about, which is the difference between print and puts. So you'll notice here I'm using this print command, I'm printing out Draft Academy, and then right below it I'm printing out Mike using this puts command. And when I use this print command, Mike just gets printed out right next to Draft Academy, as you can see over here. But if I was to take this puts command and move it up here right above Draft Academy, so now the program's gonna execute puts Mike before it executes Draft Academy, what you'll notice is that Draft Academy gets printed out on a new line. That's because whenever you use this puts command, it's gonna print out whatever you put over here and it's also gonna print out a new line afterwards, which basically means that when you use puts, you can print things out on different lines. When you use print, however, everything gets printed out on the same line. So if I wanted to print out two things right next to each other, for example, I could print out something over here like is cool. Now, these are gonna get printed out right next to each other. So you can see it says Draft Academy is cool. But if I was to do the same thing with puts, for example, if I did another puts down here and I said is cool, 
because I'm using this puts up here, this is actually gonna get printed out onto a new line. So you'll see down here, that's exactly what happened. So that's the two different ways that we can print something out onto the screen using prints and using puts. Again, puts will print out whatever you specify and then it'll print out a new line. Print will just print out whatever you specify, no new line. So that's the basic difference between those two. So now what I wanna do is just show you how we can use these print statements to draw a little shape out onto the screen. So over here, I'm just gonna say puts and I'm gonna make an open and close quotation mark and I'm actually gonna copy this a couple times. So we'll paste this like a few times down below here. And I wanna show you guys how we can just draw a basic like triangle shape. So I'm gonna start with a forward slash down here and I'll make another forward slash, another one up here and another one there. And now I'm just gonna make vertical bars going all the way down. And I'm gonna make some underscores down here. And now we have a basic little triangle right here. So you can see I'm using this put statement and individually on each one of these lines, I'm printing out some text. So now if I was to go over here and run my program, you'll notice that we're printing out this triangle and it looks pretty good. So this is sort of the basics of drawing something out onto the screen. I also wanna to talk to you guys about how these programs get executed. So when we run our Ruby program or our Ruby script, basically what happens is Ruby is gonna go through and it's gonna look at each line individually inside of this script. It's gonna start with the first line here. So it's gonna say, okay, the first instruction that the user wants me to do is print this line of text out onto the screen. So Ruby's gonna look at this first instruction, it's gonna execute it, and then once it's done with this instruction, it's gonna move on to the next instruction. So it's moving on to the next line. And it's gonna go ahead and execute this instruction. And then when it's done with this one, it's gonna move on to the next line and the next line, et cetera. So Ruby is looking through each instruction that we give it inside of our program. And an instruction in Ruby is just something like this. It's like this puts or that print that we saw before. And there's tons of these different instructions that we can give Ruby. But the point is, is that Ruby's gonna execute them in the order that we write them. So Ruby's gonna start with this line, move on to this line, etc. So if I was to take this bottom line here and move it up here to the top, now it's gonna execute this line of code first. So you'll see over here, we get this like funky looking shape. So that's sort of like the bare basics of how Ruby is working. We're giving it sets of instructions, right? I'm just writing out a bunch of different instructions and Ruby's gonna execute them in order and it's gonna do essentially whatever we tell it to do. So right now, all we're doing is telling Ruby to print something out onto the screen. But as we learn more about Ruby and as we go forward and we learn more instructions that we can give it, we can actually make programs to do just about anything. So as long as you can specify specific enough instructions for the computer, you can do anything inside of a programming language. And that's kind of like the core concept that I want to give you guys today, which is how these programs are structured and how to write essentially a basic program that prints a shape out onto the screen. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about using variables in Ruby. Now in Ruby, you're gonna be dealing with a lot of different data. And generally, anytime you write a program, there's gonna be all sorts of data that you want to maintain and manage. And a lot of times when you're dealing with large amounts of data, it can be difficult to manage it, it can be difficult to keep track of it. So in Ruby, we have a special container where we can store data values called a variable. And a variable is pretty awesome because we can actually take a piece of data or a piece of information in our Ruby programs, we can store it inside of a variable, and then whenever we wanna use that piece of data or access it or modify it, we can just refer to its variable container. And you'll see in this tutorial why variables can be really useful. So let's go ahead and jump in. Down here I have a basic Ruby program written out. Essentially all it does is it prints out a story. It says, there once was a man named George. He was 70 years old. He really liked the name George, but didn't like being 70. And you'll see I'm just using this puts instruction over here. And here it's just printing out the story onto the screen. So we're essentially just printing out everything that's over here onto the screen over here. So this is a pretty awesome program, right? It works, it's completely valid. But let's say that I wanted to go inside of my little story here and start modifying some of the information, right? 
let's say that I wanted to change the character's name. So maybe I don't like the name George and I wanna change his name to John. So I'm gonna have to go through and I found that first place where the character's name was and I have to keep searching through and then, okay, here's another place where we have the character's name. So I'm gonna change it. So now I've officially changed the character's name in the story. But let's say that I'm reading over the story again and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I think we can make the character a little bit younger. So instead of 70, why don't we make him 35, right? So again, I'm gonna have to look through this entire program all right, found the first 70, so I'll change this to a 35. I have to keep looking through, and okay, here's the other 70, so we'll change this to 35. All right, so now I've updated the name and the age. But here's the problem. When I wanted to change the character's name and the character's age, I had to manually go into my program, into this story, and modify each value. So every place where the character's name was mentioned, I had to update it to the new name. Every place where the character's age was mentioned, I had to go in and update it. And this is kind of a problem, right? This is a situation where we have two pieces of data, the character's name and the character's age, and we're trying to keep track of that information, right? But imagine that instead of just having a story that was four lines, I had a story that was hundreds of lines long, right? And they mentioned the character's name, you know, hundreds of times. If I wanted to then go through and change my character's name and my story, it would be a real drag, right? I would have to look through hundreds of lines of code in order to do that. Same goes for the age. And this is actually where variables come in. So this is a perfect example of a time where we have two pieces of information, the name and the age, and we wanna be able to keep track of them and maintain them a lot better than we currently are. So what I can actually do is I can create a container and I could put the character's name inside of its own container. I could put the character's age inside of its own container. And then when I want to access that information and use it, I can just access that container. And that container is called a variable. So I'm gonna show you guys how we can use variables to seriously increase the usability of this program. So up here, up above these puts lines, I'm actually gonna create a variable. And whenever we create a variable, we need to give Ruby some information. The first piece of information we need to give Ruby is the name of the variable that we wanna create. So generally when we create a container to put information in inside of our programs, we like to give it a descriptive name, right? Generally you wanna give the container a name that will identify what information is inside of it. So the first thing I'm gonna go do over here is type in the name of the variable that I wanna create. So I'm gonna create one called character name and generally in Ruby if you're creating a variable you want to give it a descriptive name and if there's going to be multiple words like character name you want to separate them with an underscore so the next thing I have to do is tell Ruby what I want to store inside of this variable so I can just say character name and I can use this equal sign and I can set it equal to a value so I can say character name equals and I'm just gonna say John, because this is gonna be the new character's name. So now I've officially created a variable called character name. The next thing we can do is create another variable to store the character's age. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna say character age, and I'm gonna set this equal to 35. So now we have two variables, both of which are storing values. So down here in my program, what I can actually do, instead of just typing out the character's name like this, you know, manually, I can actually just refer to the variable that is storing the character's name. So over here, instead of saying there once was a man named John, I can actually just get rid of this. And outside of these quotation marks, I'm actually gonna make a plus sign. And now I'm gonna type out the name of the variable that I wanna put in here. So I'm just gonna say, character underscore name. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm saying I wanna type out all of this text over here, plus I wanna type out the value that's inside of the character's name. So I wanna print out the value that's inside this character name variable. There's one more thing we have to do. Anytime you're using a string of text like this, and you're also using a variable name, you need to surround this whole thing with parentheses. So I'm gonna put a parentheses over there, and I'm gonna put a parentheses over here. So now, we'll actually be able to use this program. So let's go ahead and we're gonna run this program. And now you'll see that over here, it still says there once was a man named John, he was 35 years old, etc. 
But you'll notice that we didn't have to manually print, like type out the word John. All we had to do was refer to the actual variable name, character name. So I just referred to this variable and it was able to insert the value that was stored inside that variable inside of our print statement. So I could basically do this same thing for this guy down here. So I'm just gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste this in down here. So now I'm adding in the character name where John was in that other spot. So over here, we're also gonna have to put another parentheses. And I'm gonna do the same thing for the character's age. So over here, once again, we'll just surround this with parentheses. And now I'm just gonna close off both of these. So I have two separate little strings of text inside of quotation marks. And I'm gonna put a plus sign. I'm gonna type in the variable name, character age. And then I'm gonna put another plus sign. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm telling Ruby that I wanna print this out, plus I wanna print out the value inside of the character age variable, plus I wanna print this out over here. So that's essentially what this is doing. And we can do the same thing down here. So, and again, we're gonna to need to surround this with parentheses. So once we've done this, now we've actually set up our program to use all of these variables. So every place where we mention the character's age, we replaced it with the character age variable. Every place where we mentioned the character's name, we replaced it with the character name variable. So when I run this program now, you'll see over here, we get exactly the same output as we did before. We're printing out the same exact story. The only difference is now that we're using variables, our program is a lot better. So for example, if I wanted to change the character's name inside of my story, instead of having to go through and manually change it in every single spot where we mentioned it, I can actually come up here and just modify it. So I could change the character's name to Mike. And now, without having to modify anything else in my entire program, the character's name is gonna be updated to Mike. So you can see now it's using the name Mike. And that's really why variables are powerful because they allow us to organize and they allow us to keep track of the information and the data inside of our programs a lot better. The other thing you can do is you can actually modify the value of variables. So let's say halfway through my story, I wanted the character's name to change. I can actually come down here and I'm just gonna put this line of code right after these first two and right before these second two. I could change the value of a variable. So I could say character name and I can just set it equal to something else. So I could set it equal to Tom, for example. So now when I go and run my program, you'll see that halfway through the story, the character's name changes. So over here it's Mike, and then halfway through it changes to Tom. So you can update and modify the values of these variables throughout your program, and that can be extremely useful. So that's sort of the basics of variables, and these can be really useful. There's a lot more that we can talk about. So for example, over here, I'm just storing text information, right? I'm storing like the text Mike, I'm storing the text 35. Down here, we're using all this text. But in Ruby, we can actually represent, we can store a bunch of different types of data inside of our variables. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about in the next tutorial. We're gonna be talking about data types. So there's all different types of data types. We can store like text data, numbers, true false values, a bunch of different stuff. So stick around for the next tutorial and we'll talk about that. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you about data types in Ruby. A data type is essentially a type of data that we can represent and use inside of our Ruby programs. And by default, Ruby's gonna support a bunch of different data types. So these are basically just types of information that we can use in our programs. And I wanna to talk to you guys about the different types of data that we can use, and we're gonna look at how we can store those different types of data inside of variables. So down here, I'm actually gonna create a couple different variables, and we're gonna store some different types of information inside of those variables. And the first and probably most basic type of data that we can represent in our Ruby programs is called a string. And a string is basically just plain text. So anytime we wanna represent plain text in our Ruby programs, we can use a string. So I could just make a string called like name, and I could set it equal to Mike. So this is a good example of a string. It's basically a variable and we're storing a string value inside of it. So the string is just like any plain text, right? You could also make another one, occupation, we could set it equal to like 
programmer, whatever. You can store any like information that you'd want to store as plain text inside of your programs as a string. We could also store numbers. So for example, I could store a whole number. Like if I wanted to specify someone's age, I could say age is like 75, right? So someone might be 75 years old. We can represent numbers like this inside of our Ruby programs. And you'll notice that with a number, I didn't need to use these quotation marks. I just had to type out the number that I wanted to type out. You can also use decimal numbers. So this right here, 75, is what would be referred to as an integer. And an integer is basically just a counting number, like two, three, four, five, six, seven. Basically a number, like a whole number. A decimal number is different because a decimal has decimal points after it. And a lot of times, especially in Ruby, we'll refer to these numbers as floating point numbers. Basically just means that they're decimal numbers. So if I wanted to specify a floating point number, I could say like GPA, and we could set it equal to like 3.2. Or you can set it equal to 3.2854, whatever. Like you can set it equal to, you know, whatever decimal point you want to represent inside of Ruby. So using integers and using floats, you can represent different types of numbers. You can also make these negative. So I can make this like a negative 75 or a negative 3.2 and Ruby is going to be just fine with that. In addition to storing numbers, we can also store something called a Boolean. And a Boolean is basically a true false data type. So a lot of times in programs, we're gonna to wanna to represent true or false data. And this might not be something that you're super used to doing uh, in the real world, but in programming, when we're specifying types of data, a lot of data is gonna fall into like the true or false category. For example, if I created a variable called is male, this variable could tell us whether or not someone is a male, in which case it's gonna be like a true or false value, right? They're either a male or they're not. It only has two possible values. So I could set this equal to true because I'm a guy. You could also create one, you know, it could be like is tall. And this Boolean variable would tell us whether or not someone's tall, right? So if you're not tall, then it would be false. So a lot of information in our programs can be represented with one of two values, either true or false. We can also store one more type of information, which is called nil. And the nil data type basically means that it doesn't have a value. So for example, if I created a variable called like flaws and I set it equal to nil, basically what this means is this flaws variable doesn't have a value. So we can go out of our way to say that something is nil, like to say that it has no value. So these are the basic data types in Ruby. And there's actually like a couple other like more obscure data types that we could use, but for the most part, these are the data types that you're gonna be using as a beginner to the Ruby programming language. So we can store and represent information in either text form with a string, number form with an integer, which is a whole number, or a floating point number, which is like a decimal number, or we can use true or false values, and we can also use nil, which would mean no value. So these are sort of the basics. And as we go forward in this Ruby course, we're gonna be looking at all sorts of ways that we can work with this type of data. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about working with strings in Ruby. Now, strings are one of the most common data types in Ruby, and for good reason. A lot of times in our programs, we're gonna to wanna to represent and store and work with plain text data. That's essentially what a string is. So in this tutorial, I wanna walk you guys through the basics of using strings. We're gonna look at some different things we can do with strings. We're gonna also look at different things called methods, which we can use on strings. So a method is essentially just a little block of code that we can call, and it will either modify our string or give us information about our string. So it can be pretty awesome. First thing I wanna do is just show you guys basically how to print out a string. So I could say puts, and over here, to create my string, I just have to put it inside of open and closed quotation marks. So anything I put inside these quotation marks is gonna be considered a string. So I could just type out like, Draft Academy, and now this is gonna get printed out over here onto the screen. Works pretty well. There's a couple things we can do inside of these strings. So one thing you might be wondering is how can I print out a quotation mark? So for example, this string is surrounded by quotation marks. We use the quotation marks to tell Ruby where the string starts and ends. But what if I wanted to use quotation marks inside of this string? If I just try to put one right here, you'll see that it messes everything up and it ends the string. In order to use a quotation mark, I can put a backslash 
and then put the quotation mark. And this is basically gonna tell Ruby, hey, I want to literally enter in the character quotation mark. I don't wanna use it to end off my string. So now I should be able to print this out over here. You'll see we're printing out a quotation mark. You can also use something similar to print out a new line. So let's say that I wanted to print out draft and then on a new line, print out academy. I could type a backslash N and I'm actually gonna get rid of this space. And now you'll see that this is gonna print out draft academy on two separate lines. So that can be pretty useful. Another thing we can do is we can store strings inside of variables. So if I didn't wanna just type this out like this, I could put it inside of a variable, inside of a container, and it'll be a little bit easier for me to work with. So why don't we create a variable called phrase, and I'm just gonna set it equal to draft academy. Now, if we wanted to print this out, all I have to do is come down here and just type in the name of the variable that I wanna print out. So now we'll just be printing out phrase. And you'll see we're still printing out draft academy. So using these variables can be pretty useful. And when we're working with strings, we can actually use things called string methods, or sometimes you'll hear people refer to them as string functions. Essentially what these are are little blocks of code, and we can call these blocks of code, and they'll go off and they'll either modify our string, so they'll change it in some way, shape, or form, or they'll give us information about our strings. These can be really useful. And there's just a few that I wanna show you, and you'll kind of get the hang of how to use these. Um, whenever we're gonna use one of these methods, we just wanna type out either the name of the variable that's storing the string, or just the string itself. And then I wanna type out dot, and now I wanna type in the name of the method or function that we wanna access. So I'm gonna show you guys a couple that are pretty useful. I found them, in, them to be pretty useful. Now the first is called upcase. So you're just gonna type out upcase, and then an open and closed parentheses. And actually this open and closed parentheses in a lot of situations is gonna be optional, but I'm just gonna include it just to be super correct. So when I type phrase.upcase and we run this program, you'll see now it takes our string, it takes our phrase and converts it entirely into uppercase letters. You can also use another one called downcase. So instead of saying upcase, we'll just say downcase. And this is gonna convert it down to all lowercase letters. So this can be a pretty useful little function. There's also another one called strip. So if I had a string that had a bunch of leading and trailing spaces, right, I wouldn't necessarily wanna just print this out. So if I print this out onto my screen, you'll see that we get it printed out all weird, right? There's these you know, spaces in front, and there's these spaces after. You can use a method called strip. So I'm just gonna type out phrase.strip. And now when I run my program, all of that leading and trailing white space gets deleted. So a lot of cases when you're dealing with a variable, you might not know if it has leading and trailing white space. So you can use this strip method to make sure that all that disappears. We can also use these methods to find out information about our strings. For example, instead of saying strip, I could say phrase.length, and this is gonna tell me how many characters are inside of this string. So you can see over here we get 24, and actually let me get rid of all this white space. So now we should get a smaller number, 15. So Draft Academy has 15 characters in it. That's including any of the spaces that we put inside of it. In addition to figuring out how many characters are in a string, I could also figure out if certain text shows up in my strings. So for example, I could say phrase.include. So I'm gonna say include, and now I'm gonna type a question mark. And then I'm gonna type a space, and now I'm gonna type a string. I'm gonna type another string. Basically what we're saying is, we're asking this include method whether or not this phrase includes the string that we're gonna put over here. So for example, if I put academy right here, this is gonna return a true or a false value, telling us whether or not the word academy shows up inside of our phrase. So over here, we should get a true value because academy does show up. If I was to type out like academies though, so for example, this isn't inside of our phrase, it's gonna give me a false value. So that's a really good way to figure out if a certain string or a certain phrase or a certain character shows up in the string that you're working with. We could also access individual characters inside of these strings. So for example, let's say that I wanted to just figure out what the first character in this string was. So maybe I was just given this variable phrase and I don't know what's inside of it and I wanted to figure out what the first character is. I can type out the string and then I can make an open and closed square bracket. And inside of these square brackets, I can put the index of the character that I want to access. So if I wanted to access this G, I can actually put a zero inside of here. So now you'll see this is just gonna print out 
that G. If I wanted to access this I, I could put a one in here. And this is going to print out the I. If I wanted to access this A, for example, I could, it was going to be 0, 1, 2, 3. So I'm going to put a 3 in here, and now we'll be able to access that A. So if you haven't caught on already, the way that we assign index positions to strings in Ruby is starting with 0. So if I was going to give these characters index positions, I would say that G is at index position 0, I is at index position 1, R2, A3, F4, for other f5, e6, etc. So whenever we want to access the first character in a string, we have to access it using index position zero. And this is kind of like a staple of using strings in Ruby. The first character is always at index position zero. So essentially Ruby starts counting at zero. So anytime we want to use this little method right here, where we're just passing it a number, you always want to start with zero as the first character. So let's do a little experiment. Let's say I wanted to access this capital A. It's going to be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I put an eight in here. Now we're going to print out that capital A. So play around with these different string indexes. You know, this is obviously not super difficult to understand, but you want to get used to starting indexes at zero as you start programming. You can also print out a range of characters. So let's say I wanted to figure out what the first three characters inside of this string were. Well, I can say zero and I can type a comma and I can basically specify a range. So I can say I want to print out or I want to get access to the characters from position index position zero up to another index position. So we can say zero, let's say we want the first three, I can say zero up to zero, one, two, three. And this is actually gonna give me the first three characters. So it's gonna give me zero, one, and two. And it's actually not gonna give me that third index position character. So I should just get GIR here. You can see that's exactly what we get. So when we specify a range down here, we start the range at the first index position, zero, and we end it at three, but we don't include the character at index position three. So we didn't include this A. So that's basically how we can grab like characters in a specific range inside of a string. You can also use another method, and I'm just gonna type phrase dot index. And basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna tell us what position a specific character in our string starts at. So for example, I could say phrase dot index and I could type in like a capital G and this should give me a zero because zero is where our capital G is at. If I typed in like a capital A here, this should give me the index position where capital A shows up inside of our string. So that's going to be an eight. You can also type in just a normal string here. So I could say like FFE and this will tell me where FFE starts inside of my string and it starts at index position four. So zero, one, two, three, four. Four. This index method is actually pretty useful. So these string methods can be extremely useful when you're working with strings and they basically just allow you to take your strings and you can either modify them or you can find out different information about them. And these are going to be very useful. I also just want to point out that you can use these little methods on things other than just variables. So for example, if I came down here, I could print out like a string and I could say dot and now I could say like upcase. And it's still going to work exactly like it worked when we used it on that variable. So now when I run this, it'll do exactly the same thing. So you don't have to have these inside of variables in order to use these different methods. So those are just a couple of the different methods that you can use with strings in Ruby. What I would recommend is going on Google and just typing in like Ruby string methods. And there, you know, there should be like huge lists of all the different methods that you can use with these strings. But I would say for the most part, those are some of the most common methods that you're going to be seeing. And really, I just wanted to give you guys an introduction into how we can work with strings inside of our programs. Wanted to talk about how we can use different methods to do different things. Hopefully you've learned something and hopefully now you can go off and start playing around with strings inside of your programs. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you about working with numbers in Ruby. So we're gonna take a deep dive and we're gonna look at all the different things you can do with numbers. We'll talk about the different types of numbers in Ruby. And we're gonna look at some awesome Ruby methods that we can use on our numbers to do a bunch of different stuff. So this is gonna be a pretty cool tutorial. So down here, uh, I'm just gonna show you guys the basics of working with numbers. Um, I could just say like puts and this will just print something onto the screen just so we can kind of see what's going on. 
When I want to use a number in Ruby, it's really easy. You just type out the number. So I could type out like five, for example. And now this is going to get printed out onto the screen as five. In addition to just using whole numbers like this, we could also use decimal numbers. So I could say like 5.86543. It's going to do exactly the same thing. So now over here, it'll be able to print that out. We can also use negative numbers. So I can put a negative in front of here. And again, Ruby's gonna have no problem dealing with negative numbers. In addition to just using numbers though, we can also use basic arithmetic. So for example, I could say like five plus nine, and this will actually be able to go through and print out the answer. So not only is Ruby gonna print out five plus nine, it's actually gonna do that calculation for us and print the answer out onto the screen, which is pretty cool. So we can use addition, we could use subtraction, we could use multiplication, which is just this asterisk. We could use division. So those are like the four basic types of, arith of arithmetic, but we can also use exponentials. So for example, let's say I wanted to take two raised to like the third power. I can just do something like this. I can say two multiplication, multiplication. So two asterisks and then three. And this is basically gonna be the same thing as saying two raised to the third power. So now we should get two cubed, which is eight. So this can be a really handy operation here. We can also use something else which is called the modulus operator. So I could say, for example, 10, a percent sign, and then three. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna take 10, it's gonna divide it by three, and it's gonna spit out the remainder. So 10 divided by three is three, right? Three, six, nine with a remainder of one. So when I run this, you'll see it prints out a one. So it's basically printing out the remainder that we get from dividing these two numbers. And that can be pretty useful. In addition to just having numbers over here like this, I could also store numbers inside of a variable. So I could come over here and say like num, this is the name of the variable and we could set it equal to like 20. And then down here, if I wanted to access that number, I can just print out the variable. So now we're printing out the actual variable. And I wanna point out um, one cool thing with numbers is you can actually print out numbers and strings inside of the same print statement. So for example, I could say like my fave num and over here, I can put a plus sign. And what this is basically gonna allow me to do is print out this string alongside this number. But you'll see over here, when I actually print this out, we're gonna get a couple errors. And the first thing we have to do is we always have to wanna put this inside of parentheses. So I'm gonna surround this whole thing with parentheses. That's because we're referring to this variable. But also, if I wanna print out a number alongside of a string, I actually have to convert this number into a string. And I can do that by saying num dot two underscore s. And basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna take this number it's gonna convert it into a string, and then we'll be able to print both of these side by side. So you can see now it just says my fave num 20. That's a really useful way to do something like that. So in addition to just working with normal numbers, we can actually use special things called methods. And a method is essentially just a block of code that we can call, which will either modify our number or it'll give us information about our number. Sometimes it'll also do like mathematical calculations on the number. So down here I could say like puts num, when I want to access one of these number methods, I can say dot, and then I can type out the name of the method that I want to use. So for example, I can say num.abs and an open and close parentheses. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to tell me the absolute value of num. So if I put like a, a negative 20 up here, now this is just going to return 20 because it's giving me the absolute value. There's also some methods that we can use with decimal numbers. So for example, if this was like 20.487, I can use num.round, and this will actually round the number for me. So over here, you'll see we just get 20. So it's basically rounded the number. But if I was to make this like a six, now we should get 21. So it's rounding it up or down. You can also use a ceiling and a floor function. So a ceiling will always take the higher number, and the floor will always take the lower number. So for example, if I said 20.187, or let's just say 20.1, and I said num.ceil, this is actually just gonna return 21. So it's gonna give us the highest number, or it's gonna give us the next highest number from 20. If I was to say like 20.9 and I said num.floor, this is just gonna give me 20. So it's basically just gonna cut off that decimal point, give me the lower number. In addition to just using these normal methods, or you also hear these referred to sometimes as functions. Um, so in addition to using these methods or functions, we can also use other special methods, which are inside of something called the math class. 
And don't worry too much about what a class is, but essentially there's this entity inside of our Ruby programs called math, and we can use it to perform specific math operations on numbers. So if I came over here, I could type out math like that with the capital M, I can type a dot, and now inside of this math class, and again, don't worry too much about what a class is, but inside of this math entity in Ruby, there's a bunch of these methods that we can use. So for example, I could say math.sqrt, and an open and close parentheses. Now inside of this open and close parentheses, I can give this a number. So for example, I could put like 36 inside of here. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna give us the square root of this number 36. So you can see over here, we get six. You could also use something like the logarithmic function. So I could say math.log, put like a one in here, and now we're gonna get 0.0, .0 back. So there's a lot of these different like math operations. You can do a lot of things with like sine, cosine, tangent, like logarithmic stuff. So this can be really useful if you're just trying to work with math inside of Ruby. So the last thing I want to talk to you guys about in this tutorial is working with uh, floating point numbers and working with integer numbers. So there's two basic types of numbers in Ruby. We have integer numbers, which are like whole numbers. So an integer would be like 20 or 21 or 22. And we also have decimal numbers, which would be like 22.1, 22.2, etc. Integers and floats can be used inside of Ruby basically interchangeably, although there are two like separate types. So Ruby does distinguish between a whole number and a floating point number. But I wanna show you guys how we can use these together. So for example, like if I came down here and I just added two integers, like I added one plus seven, you'll notice that we're gonna get an integer back. So it's gonna be eight. But if I added like 1.0 and seven, now you'll see we're getting a floating point number back. So we're getting a decimal back. So whenever you add two integers, you always get an integer back or multiply two integers, divide, subtract two integers. You're always gonna get an integer back. So for example, if I said like 10 divided by seven, this shouldn't be an integer number. This should be like some long decimal number, but you'll notice that I'm just getting a one back. So I'm only getting an integer back. But if I said like 10 divided by 7.0, now I'm gonna get the full number back. So whenever you're using an integer and a floating point number together to do some operation, you're always gonna get a floating point back. If you're using two integers, you'll get an integer back. And if you're using two floats, obviously you're gonna get a floating point number back. So that's kind of the, the difference between those two. And Ruby doesn't really give you too much of a hassle when you're using numbers. You, know, you can basically use integers and floats interchangeably, but just know that Ruby does distinguish between the two of them. So if you're doing different types of math with different types of numbers like integers or floating point numbers, there's gonna be a difference in the type of answer that you're gonna get. So that's really the basics of working with numbers. I mean, I could spend all day talking about all the different methods and you know little caveats here and there that you can use with numbers in Ruby, but I think that's kind of a good uh, coverage of the basics. And so now your job is just to go off and play around with all this different stuff and really just get comfortable working with numbers in your Ruby program. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about getting input from users in Ruby. This is gonna be awesome. Basically gonna allow a user to input information into our programs. We're gonna store whatever they input into a variable, and then we're gonna print out that variable along with a message that basically just says hi to whoever entered the information. So in order to get information from the user, we're actually gonna to have to do one thing. And if you've been following along with this course, we've been using this Atom Runner program in order to run our Ruby files. And this is a really awesome, convenient way in order to just run a Ruby file. But here's the problem. If we wanna get input from a user inside of our Ruby programs, we actually can't use this little Atom Runner plugin to do it. We're gonna have to use something called the terminal or the command prompt. Now, if you're on Windows, this is a program called the command prompt. If you're on Mac, it's called the terminal. Basically, it's an environment where we can interact with our computer using text. And in order to interact with the computer and input information into our Ruby programs, we're gonna have to use the terminal. So the first thing I wanna do is just show you guys how to set that up, and then we'll look at getting input from the user. So this is gonna be instructions for doing this inside of Atom. Over here, I'm just gonna go over to the preferences inside Atom or the settings. And down here, I'm just gonna click this install tab and I wanna search for a package. We're looking for a package which is called platformio-ide 
terminal. So search for this and you'll see it shows up over here and I actually already have it installed, but you want to install this Platformio IDE terminal. Basically what this is going to allow us to do is use a terminal or a command prompt if you're on Windows straight from inside Atom. So install that and now we're just going to go back over here. Um, you might need to restart your Atom program in order to use it, but eventually what you should get is a little plus sign. You'll see there's this plus sign down here at the bottom left. And when I hover over it, it says new terminal. So once you have this installed, you want to go ahead and click that and a little terminal window should pop up down here. You'll notice mine is just black with white text. So this is where we can run our Ruby program in order to get input from a user. And this is also another way that you can run your Ruby programs. So down here, as long as you have your Ruby file open inside of Atom, so as long as this file is open, when you open up Platformio IDE terminal into a new terminal, it should automatically open up to the location where your Ruby file is. Now, you know, I, I'm not going to get too into like using the terminal in this tutorial, but essentially you can navigate through the different folders and the different files inside of your computer using the terminal or the command prompt. Um, so as long as you have your Ruby file open, like I have this draft.ruby file open, this should automatically open to the correct directory. So you won't have to worry about that. So once we're here, I just want to type in Ruby. And then I want to type in the name of the file that I want to run. So in my case, it's just draft.rb. And what this is going to do is it's going to run the file for us. So now when I click enter, it's going to run the file and you know, it'll basically stop. We don't have any code up here. So if I was to print out like, hello, now when I run this again, I can just type it in and click enter and you'll see that we get the program running. So that's basically how we can run a Ruby program from inside of our command line or inside of our terminal. So we're gonna have to do this in order to get input from the user, just so you guys know. All right, so let's talk about how we can get input from the user. Basically, I'm gonna allow the user to input a piece of information. We're gonna store that piece of information inside of a variable and we're gonna print it out onto the screen. So first thing I wanna do is actually just type out a prompt. So I wanna tell the user what I want them to enter. So I can just say puts and I'm just gonna say, enter your name. And now once we've prompted them to enter some information, I can use a special command in Ruby called gets. And basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna allow the user to enter a piece of information into our program. So it's basically gonna stop the execution of the program and wait for the user to enter something. And what I wanna do is I wanna store whatever the user enters inside of a variable. So I'm actually gonna create a variable called name and I'm gonna set it equal to gets. And basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna tell Ruby to take whatever the user inputs into the program and store it inside of this name variable. So the last thing I wanna do is come down here and I'm just gonna say puts and I'm gonna print out some text. So I'm gonna say hello plus name. So basically I'm printing out hello to whoever entered in information into the program. So I'm gonna save this. Now I'm gonna come down here and I'm just gonna run this program. So you'll notice um, if you click the up arrow on your arrow keys on your keyboard, it'll actually just insert the last line that you entered. So I just click the up arrow here. And now when I click enter, you'll see that it says enter your name. So I'm gonna enter my name, it's gonna be Mike. And now when I click enter, and actually we're getting an error here. I, this should actually be puts down here, not put, that's my bad. So let's do this again. So I'm gonna enter my name, Mike. And now when I click enter, it's gonna say, hello, Mike. So it's basically just saying hi to me. So that's the basics of getting input from the user. You can use this gets in order to get specific information. Now I do wanna to talk to you guys about one more thing, which is basically something that happens in Ruby when we enter information. And let me sort of illustrate this. So down here I'm saying, hello, name. And after this, why don't we print something else out? So I'll say like, you are cool, All right? So I'm basically printing out, hello, name, you are cool. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and run this program and you guys will see what happens. So I'm running the program, I'm entering in my name, Mike. Now when I click enter, you'll notice that it prints out, hello, Mike, but then it prints out a new line and it says that other text. Basically what's happening here is when I click enter, Ruby is not only taking that as the text that we entered, but also as a new line. So whenever you click enter, it basically like is gonna insert a new line. So Ruby is essentially printing out Mike, 
then the new line character, and then all the text over here. In order to mitigate that, all I have to do is come over here and say name is equal to gets dot chomp and an open and close parentheses. And this is going to get rid of that new line character that happens when we click enter. So now when I run my program, it's going to be able to work correctly. So I'll say enter your name, Mike. And now it just says, hello, Mike, you are cool. So now our program is working perfectly. So if you want to keep that new line, when the user clicks enter, you can go ahead and just not put dot chomp here. But in a lot of cases, you're going to want to go ahead and just put that in there. So that's the basics of getting input from a user. And if I wanted, I could get multiple pieces of information. So for example, I could say puts enter your name, and I'm actually just going to copy this. And now we'll say like enter your age and we'll do the same thing. I'll store it in a variable called age. So now we could actually come down here and we could print out like, hello, Mike, you are, and then we could just print out like the age. So now it'll just be printing out age. So now we can get two pieces of input from the user. So let's run our program and it says, enter your name, Mike. And let's say that I'm like 59. So now it's printing out, hello, Mike, you are 59. So we're getting input from the user. We're getting two pieces of input from the user and we're printing them out onto the screen. So that's the basics of getting input. And in the next couple of lessons, we're going to talk about other ways that we can do this and basically ways we can make this work a little bit better. In this tutorial, I'm going to teach you guys how to build a very basic calculator in Ruby. We're basically going to build a little program that will allow the user to enter in two numbers and then we'll print out the sum of those two numbers. So we'll get the two numbers from the user, we'll add them together and we'll tell them what the answer is. It's gonna be pretty cool and it'll kind of give you guys uh, some more information about getting input from users, specifically how we can get numbers from users. So keep in mind in this lesson, we're gonna be using the terminal or the command prompt uh, in order to get information from the user. So you want to make sure that either if you're using Atom, you can use this Platformio IDE terminal plugin that I talked to you guys about in the last lesson, or you can just use your normal like terminal or your normal command prompt. Um, so I'm going to be using this little Atom plugin that I have. So let's talk about how we can get input from the user. Specifically, we need to get two numbers. So down here in our program, we can just write out the code to do that. So I'm going to first write a prompt. I'm just going to say puts. And we're just going to type out a message for the user. So we'll say enter a number. And then we're basically going to get that number that they entered and store it inside of a variable. So I'm going to create a variable called num1 and I'm going to set it equal to gets dot chomp. And gets is basically going to get whatever information the user enters in and chomp is going to get rid of the new line that they accidentally enter when they click the enter button. So whenever you click enter in Ruby and you're inputting information into the program, it's going to add a new line on, onto the end of whatever you input. So this is just going to get rid of that for us. The next thing I want to say is another prompt. So I'm going to say puts and I'm going to tell them to enter another number. And once again, we're going to do the same thing. So I'm just going to say num2 is equal to gets.chomp. So essentially, we're asking them to enter in two numbers. Now, all we want to do is just print out the result of those two numbers. So I'm going to put, and I'm going to put this inside of parentheses, and I'm going to say num1 plus num2, right? Essentially, what we're doing is we're getting two numbers, and then we're printing out the sum of those two numbers onto the screen. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to come down here into my terminal window and I'm just going to run this program. So I'm just going to type out Ruby draft.rb and this is going to run the program for me. So it says down here, enter a number. So why don't we enter five, enter another number. Let's enter two. And now when I click enter, this should add the two numbers together and print out the answer. So I'll click enter. And you'll notice down here, we're actually getting a little bit weird of an answer. We're getting the answer 52. Now, last time I checked, five plus two wasn't 52. Essentially what we're doing is we're concatenating these two strings together. So here's the problem. When you enter in information into Ruby, Ruby automatically just converts whatever you enter in into a string. So by, you can enter in as many numbers as you want. You can enter in decimal numbers, normal numbers, doesn't matter. Ruby's just going to convert it into a string. 
And when we add two strings together like this inside of a put statement, it just does what's called concatenating the strings. So it takes the first string and adds the other string onto the end of it, right? So that's why we get five, two. Um, in order to actually add these two numbers together, we're gonna have to convert the strings that the user enters into numbers. So over here, we're getting a number num1, here we're getting a number num2, but remember, when we actually store those variables, they're getting stored as strings. So all we have to do is take num1, convert it into a number, take num2, convert it into a number, and then we'll be able to run this program successfully. So all I have to do to do that is just say num1.2, an underscore, and then an i. So it's num1.2i. And basically what this means is we're converting num1 into an integer. I'm gonna do the same thing over here, dot two i. So now we're basically taking these two strings, num1 and num2, and converting them into integers. So Ruby's gonna take whatever the numbers that were inside of those strings and convert them into integers. So let's go ahead and run our program. So I'm gonna come down here. I'm just gonna type in clear, and I'm gonna type in Ruby draft.rb. So it says enter a number, we'll enter in five, enter another number, let's enter in two, now when I click enter, you'll notice that we're getting the answer, which is seven. So that's pretty awesome, right? We were able to build our calculator and it was able to add the numbers together. Here's the problem though. Let's say I come down here and I run this program again and I enter in a five, but now I enter in a 2.5. So for example, instead of just entering in two, I'm entering in a decimal number, 2.5. When I run this program now, you'll notice that we're still getting seven. So our program wasn't able to add this, this 0.5 onto the answer. That's because over here, we're converting these to integers. So we're saying num1 is gonna get converted into an integer, num2 is gonna get converted into an integer. And so really all this is doing is it's adding in the integer five and it's adding in the integer value of 2.5, which is just gonna be two together. So if I wanna be able to add in decimal numbers in my program, instead of saying two I, I'm gonna say two F. And two F is basically gonna convert whatever is inside of those strings into floating point numbers, so into decimal numbers. So now when I run this program down here, we'll be able to do that addition. So if I say Ruby, and I'm just gonna enter in a five, and now we'll enter in that 2.5, and now this should give us the number that we wanted. So we're gonna get 7.5. So 2f or 2i are two really useful little functions that we can use on numbers. And in some cases, you're only gonna want the user to be able to enter in integers, so you can just say 2i. In other cases, though, you want them to use uh, floating points, so we can use 2f. So that's the basics of building our little calculator. Now I also wanna point out one way that we can make this program a little bit easier. So instead of saying num1.2f down here, I could actually come up here and I could say gets.chomp.2f. And I could do the same for this one over here, .2f. And now this is gonna convert them up here so we don't have to convert them down here. So this is gonna work exactly the same as it worked before. So I could say like 5.6 and 7.2 and it'll be able to add them. So that's just another way that we can do that. But that's sort of how we can build a basic calculator inside of our Ruby programs. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about building a Mad Libs game in Ruby. So we're gonna build a little Mad Libs game and I'll kind of show you some more about how we can get input from a user. So if you're not familiar with Mad Libs, a Mad Libs is basically just a game where you would enter in like a bunch of random like words, maybe like nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and then you'd take all of those words that you'd enter in and like sort of sprinkle them in inside of a story. And generally like since you're entering in random words, the story is gonna be like kind of funny. So over here I have an example of a Mad Lib. You can see down here it's like telling the user to enter in like a noun, a plural noun, an adjective. And we're actually can build a Mad Libs game inside of our Ruby program. So down here you'll notice I have a little basic program set up. It's basically printing out this poem, roses are red, violets are blue, I love you. And so this is, you know, kind of a classic poem, but I think we can mix it up a little bit and create a Mad Libs for this poem. So how about we say, Instead of roses or red, we'll let the user enter in a color. Instead of saying violets or blue, we'll let them enter in a plural noun. 
And instead of saying, I love you, why don't we let them enter in like someone else? So maybe like a celebrity. Instead of having just roses or red, violets or blue, I love you, we'll have roses are and whatever the color the user enters in, whatever the plural noun they enter in are blue and then I love a certain celebrity. So this should be kind of funny. So let's set up our program. The first thing I wanna do is get input from the user. So I wanna be able to get three pieces of information from the user. I wanna get the color, I wanna get the plural noun, and then I wanna get the celebrity. After we get that input, then we'll intersperse those variables inside of this little output. So let's get the input from the user. I'm just gonna come over here and we'll just print out a prompt. It'll just say, enter a color. So the first thing they'll do is enter the color. And now what we're gonna do is store that in a variable called color. So I'll say color is equal to gets.chomp. And remember, chomp is just getting rid of the new line that gets entered when you click the enter button. All right, so we'll enter in a guess, and we're also gonna do two more of these. So I'm just gonna paste this two more times. And then we're gonna enter in a plural noun, and we'll make a variable called plural noun. And finally, they're gonna enter in a celebrity. So we'll make a variable called celebrity. So now we have three variables that are storing the three pieces of information that the user input. Last step is to come down here, and instead of just printing out color inside of curly brackets, I'm actually just gonna add in that color variable. So we'll print out color, same thing for the plural noun, and same thing for the celebrity. Now our program is essentially set up. We're getting the input and then we're just printing out the actual bad libs. So remember, whenever we get input from the user, I have to use my terminal down here. So instead of just using this little like Atom Runner plugin that we've been using throughout the course, I'm gonna use my terminal. And down here, I'm just gonna go to the directory where my Ruby file is stored and I can just run it. So I'm just gonna say ruby draft.rb, that's the name of the file, and I'm gonna run the program. So it's gonna ask me to enter a color, so why don't we enter in like magenta. It says enter a plural noun, I'm gonna enter in microwaves, and enter a celebrity, why don't we do like Tom Hanks. So now what should happen when I click enter is all of that information should get put inside of our Mad Libs and we should get the finished story. So I'm gonna click enter, and you'll see down here, we get our finished story. So it just says, roses are magenta, microwaves are blue, I love Tom Hanks. So basically the user could run this program, they could enter in all the words for the Mad Lib, and then we'll basically just be printing out the Mad Lib. So it's actually a pretty simple program. You can see how easy it is to build a game like a Mad Lib inside of Ruby, it's super easy. And also, if you wanted, you could make this a lot more complex. So, you know, you could add it, have them add in like adverbs, verbs, adjectives, like all sorts of stuff inside of here, make obviously the story a little bit longer, and you could essentially replicate any Mad Lib inside of your Ruby program, which is awesome. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about using arrays in Ruby. In Ruby, we're gonna be dealing with lots of information. And a lot of times when you're writing programs, there's gonna be a bunch of different values that you wanna store and keep track of. And one way that we can keep track of the data inside of our programs is using a simple variable. Here's the problem with the variable though. It can only really store one single value. And so I can create a variable, I could store a value inside of it, but what happens when I have lots of data? It's gonna be kind of a pain in the butt to have to create like hundreds of different variables if I wanna keep track of and maintain hundreds of different pieces of information. And this is where arrays come in. An array is essentially a structure or a container, a lot like a normal variable, the only difference being that an array can hold multiple values. So unlike a normal variable, an array can hold like 10 or 20 or 100 or a million different items inside of it. And a lot of times when we're programming in Ruby and we're dealing with large amounts of information, we're gonna want to be able to use arrays. So let's jump in. I'm gonna show you guys how to use arrays. We'll talk about you know what they are, how to create them, how to put stuff inside of them, and all that fun stuff. So down here, if I wanna create an array, I create it a lot like I would a normal variable. The first thing we have to do is tell Ruby what we want the array to be called. So in my case, why don't we make an array that's gonna store a bunch of names of my friends. So I can make an array called friends, and I'm gonna set this equal to array with a capital A, and then we're gonna make an open and closed square bracket. 
inside of this open and close square bracket, I can start putting in some of the pieces of data that I want to store in this array. In my case, I'm just going to store a bunch of strings with names of some of my friends. So I can store one like Kevin, Karen, and Oscar. So here we have an array that has three elements inside of it. And each one of these pieces of data are referred to as array elements. So basically what I did is I created a container that can hold multiple pieces of information. So what I can do now is I can come down here and I could just say like puts friends and this is actually going to print out all of the information inside of this array, all of the data values on my output over here. So you can see we're printing out Kevin, Karen, and Oscar. So that's the basics of using an array. And if I didn't want to just store strings, I could store any type of data inside here. So I could store strings, I could even store like a number, or I could store a Boolean value like false. You can put all different types of information, all different data types inside of these arrays. And if you want, you can even put different data types together in the same array. But for our purposes, let's just stick with strings. So let's say that I wanted to access one specific element inside of this array. Well, if I want to access just one element, I can make an open and closed square brackets after I'm referring to the variable name. And I can put an index inside of here. So let's say that I wanted to grab Kevin. Let's say I wanted to grab this first string inside of my array. I can put a zero inside of here. And a zero refers to the index of this Kevin value. So now when I print this out, you'll see we're just printing out Kevin. And this brings me to a point about arrays. We start indexing arrays at zero. So I would say that this Kevin attribute or this Kevin element inside of the array is at index position zero. Karen is at index position one and Oscar is at index position two. So the first element is always in index position zero, and then you just basically count up from there. So if I wanted to access Oscar over here, I could put a two inside of here, and now this is gonna print out Oscar. Another thing I can do is I can access array elements from the back of the array. So for example, another way I could access Oscar would be by putting a negative one in here. Basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna grab the item in the array, but it'll start counting from the back. So it'll basically like this would be negative one, Oscar, this would be negative two, and this would be negative three. So if I said negative two in here, now we're gonna be grabbing Karen and printing that out. So that's two different ways that we can access elements inside the array. I could also grab a range of elements. So for example, let's say I only wanted to grab the first two elements inside this array and I didn't wanna grab the third one. I could say zero and then I could say two. And basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna grab index position zero all the way up to, but not including index position two. So it's gonna grab zero and one and it's gonna stop at two. So we're not gonna grab two. So now we're just gonna get Kevin and Karen. And this can be really useful just specifying like a range inside of this square brackets. There's also a bunch of other stuff that we can do with these arrays. So for example, let's say I wanted to modify one of the values inside the array. Well, I can come down here and I can just say friends. Let's say I wanted to change this uh, first element at index position zero. I could say friends zero and I can give it a new value. So I could say like Dwight. And now instead of having the value of Kevin, this is gonna have the value of Dwight. So when we print it out, we get that new value. And you can access and modify any individual element inside the array just by referring to its index. There's also gonna be situations where you're not gonna know exactly what elements you wanna put inside of the array right up front. So for example, over here, I knew exactly what friends I wanted to put in this array. But in some cases, you're not gonna know that right off the bat. So we can just say array.new and now we're basically telling Ruby that we want friends to be an array, but that we don't wanna put any values into it just yet. Then down in my program, I can just start putting stuff in here. So for example, right now, if I printed out friends zero, you'll notice that nothing prints out. It's just a, a nil value, right? If I came over down here though, I could say friends zero, and I can just give this whatever value I want. So I could give this a value of like Michael. And now friends zero is gonna be Michael. And you can do that as, as much as you want. So I could even come down here and say like friends five and I could give this a value. So now this is gonna be equal to Holly. And what you'll see over here when I print out just the entire friends array, 
it's gonna fill in all of the elements that are between zero and five just with blank elements. So those are just gonna be nil. And so that's kind of how you can create an array and not give it some initial information yet, and then add in information later. There's also a, a bunch of different methods that we can use with these arrays. So let's go back to that array that we were using before with all the friends. So if I wanted to access specific information about this array, I can use little methods. So I could say like friends dot, and one really useful one is length. So this will tell me how many elements are inside of this array. So you see over here we have three. I can also check to see if certain elements are inside the array. So I could say friends dot include, and then I'm gonna put a question mark. And over here I can type in an element that I would wanna to check to see if it's in the array. So I could say like Karen. And now this should give us a true value because Karen is inside of the array. If I put like Karen's though, so I changed it, now this is gonna give a false value because that's not in the array. You can also modify the order of the array. So I could say like friends.reverse and this will reverse all the elements. So now it's gonna be Oscar, Karen, and then Kevin, as you can see over here. You can also sort different elements in the array. So for example, if I wanted, I could sort all the elements. So if I were working with strings, we could sort them alphabetically. So if I put something over here, like Andy, and now Andy's gonna end up being in the front because it's going to sort the array alphabetically. So I'll say friends.sort. And now when we print this out, you'll see it's Andy, Karen, Kevin, and Oscar. So it moved Andy to the front because A comes before K and O. It's important to note though, that if you're gonna have an array that has multiple data types, so for example, if I put a, a number like an integer in here, this is gonna throw an error now because you can't sort it. There's no, there's no way for us to compare like numbers and strings inside of Ruby. So that's the basics of working with arrays and arrays are super useful. There's gonna to be tons of situations where we're gonna to wanna to store large amounts of information in a single container and arrays are great at doing that. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about using hashes in Ruby. Now a hash is basically a type of data structure where we can store a bunch of different pieces of information. If you're familiar with arrays in Ruby, they're very similar to arrays. So a hash is basically doing the same thing. It's allowing us to store multiple pieces of information. The difference is that with hashes, we can actually store something called a key value pair. And a key value pair is basically where we can store a value and we can give it a key, which is kind of like a name. Now, a lot of times you'll hear hashes also called dictionaries. Um, that's because they act a lot like dictionaries. Uh, picture a dictionary, like in a dictionary you have two parts to every word, right? You have the actual word itself, but then in addition to the word, you actually have the definition, right? So you could say that the word is the key and the definition is the value. So that's basically what a hash is. And you'll kind of see um, what this is as we kind of go through this tutorial. In this tutorial, I wanna build a little hash which will store uh, state codes. So for example, I live in the United States and we have a bunch of different states and each state has a specific code. So for example, Pennsylvania, PA, right? New York is NY, California is CA, Michigan is MI, right? So you can map a state like New York to a specific abbreviation like NY. We can map California to a specific abbreviation, CA. And that's basically what I want to represent inside of my hash. So we're gonna build a hash which can store all of those different abbreviations. And you'll see why these data structures are useful and how they're different from arrays. So down here, I want to create my hash. And in order to do that, you basically just have to give the hash a name. So I'm just gonna call this states. And I'm gonna set it equal to an open and closed curly bracket, just like that. And a lot of times when people are making hashes, they'll end up putting a new line here. So inside of here, we can specify a bunch of different key value pairs, okay? So what I want, I want the keys to be the actual state names, and I want the values to be the abbreviations for those states. So basically, all we have to do is just type out a key, and then we can type out a value. So the first thing I'm gonna do is type a key. So why don't we map like, Pennsylvania. And so Pennsylvania is going to be the key. And now I can map this to a value. So I can just say equals and then a greater than sign. And over here I can type in a value. So I'm just going to type PA. Okay. 
So essentially what I'm doing is I'm defining the key and I'm defining the value. Now I'm gonna type a comma and I can go and define another key value pair. So why don't we do New York? Let's say New York and we're gonna map this to NY. And why don't we do another one? Oregon is another state and we'll map this to OR. So in here, I basically have three different states and I'm not gonna do all 50 states, but I have a key and then I have a value. Now here's one thing you need to know about these hashes is you can only have unique keys. So for example, I couldn't create another key down here called Pennsylvania. That's gonna be a big no-no when we're creating hashes. You always wanna have unique keys. All right, so now that we have these input into here, we can actually start using this hash. So down here, if I wanted, I could just print this out. So I could come down here and say puts, and it's just called states, so we could put this. And when I print this out, you'll notice that we're printing out this little structure. It's just like Pennsylvania, and that gets mapped to PA, New York gets mapped to NY, etc. But one of the most powerful things we can do with these hashes is we can actually give it a key and it'll tell us the corresponding value. So I could come in here and inside of these square brackets, I can just input a key. So I can input like Oregon. And now this is gonna print out the value for Oregon. So it's gonna print out OR. I could put inside here, New York. And now this is gonna print out NY because it maps to New York. So that's like a super useful way that we can store our data. We could give this structure a key and it would spit out the corresponding value. There's also a couple other ways that we can create these keys. So for example, instead of putting Pennsylvania inside of quotation marks, I could also just put a colon here. And now this is gonna be the same thing. So down here I could specify like Pennsylvania and actually this should be capital. And now it'll still give me that same value. So it'll, it'll still give me PA up here. You can also use, in addition to like strings, we could also use numbers. So down here I could say one. And if I put one down here, now we're basically gonna get the same thing. So this should still print out PA and you can see that it does over there. So these hashes are extremely useful and there's a lot of situations where you're gonna wanna map keys to values. So for example, in this situation, we're mapping a key, which is the state name to a value, which is the state abbreviation. But you could do the same thing for like days of the week. Or you could do it for month abbreviations. You could do it for, I mean, really, there's tons of situations where this type of structure is gonna come in handy. And now I just wanna point out how these are different from arrays. So normally when I create an array, I'm just creating like a list of individual values, right? But when I create a hash, I'm creating a list of key value pairs. And I can give this hash a specific key and it'll spit out the corresponding value. So this is a very useful data structure. This is definitely something you're gonna to wanna to play around with and get used to using. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about methods in Ruby. Now a method is basically just a block of code that we can write which will perform a specific task for us. A lot of times in Ruby, you're gonna have different groups of code, different groupings of code. They're gonna perform specific tasks or they're gonna do certain things. And what we can do in Ruby is we can take all of that code that's you know, designed to perform one task. We can put it inside something called a method. And what's cool about methods is you can actually call them from other places inside your program. And we can give methods information and then they can give us information back. So in this tutorial, I'm just gonna to talk to you guys about the basics of using methods. We're gonna write a method and we're gonna look at how they can be useful. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create a method. And our method is gonna be very simple. All it's gonna do is say hi to the user. So our method's gonna perform one task, it has one goal, and it's gonna say hi to the user. So down here, I'm gonna create my method. The first thing we always wanna do when we create a method is type out DEF. And this basically means that we're defining a method. Second thing we wanna do is give our method a name. So generally, you wanna give your methods descriptive names so it's very obvious what task they're performing. In our case, our method is saying hi to someone, so we can just call it say hi just like that. And now what I wanna do is hit enter and I'm gonna come down here and I'm just gonna type end. 
So essentially what I'm doing is I'm defining a method block and anything that's in between def and end is gonna be inside of our method. A lot of times people will indent here just to show that the code is like inside the method. So in here, again, we have one goal, we wanna say hi. So I'm just gonna type puts and I'll just say, hello user, cool. So now I'm gonna run my program and we'll see if this method works. So I'm just gonna run the program. But you'll notice over here when I run the program, nothing's showing up. And that's because when we define a method, the code inside of the method is only gonna get executed when we call it. So in other words, if we wanna execute the code inside this method, we have to call the method. That basically just means we have to say like, hey method, go do your stuff, go perform your task. So I can come down here and the way I call this method is just by typing out its name. So I can type out say hi, and now Ruby is going to execute this method up here. So you can see over here, we have hello user. So everything's working. And I just wanna show you guys one thing. So if I typed out like top up here and then typed out bottom over here, I wanna show you guys the flow of these methods inside of our program. So now when I run this program, you'll see we're printing out top, hello user, and then bottom. Essentially what's happening is Ruby is looking at this line of code, it's executing it, then it sees say hi. So it knows, okay, the user wants me to execute the say hi method. So Ruby's gonna jump up, it's gonna execute all of the code inside of this say hi method. And then once it's done executing all of that code, it's gonna jump down, back down here, and it's gonna print out bottom. And I just wanna point out, you could put as many lines of code inside of one of these methods as you want. Obviously this is like a simple method, so we're just keeping it simple. But that's the basic execution flow of functions or methods. And actually this brings me to a good point. A lot of times these are called methods, but you'll also hear people calling these functions. Essentially in the case of Ruby, these words are basically interchangeable. Basically means the same thing, but for the most part in Ruby, we're referring to them as methods. All right, so let me show you guys some more cool stuff we can do. One thing we can do is we can actually give these methods some information. So I can actually take this say hi method and I could actually allow the user to tell it who to say hi to. And the way that I'm gonna do that is after I type the name of the method say hi, I'm gonna make an open and closed parentheses. And over here, I just wanna specify what's called a parameter. And a parameter is basically a value that whoever is calling this method is going to give to it. So this method can actually accept inputs, it can accept parameters as input. So over here, I can just type out the name of the parameter I want to accept. So in our case, we'll just call this name because it's going to be the name of who we want to say hi to. And then down here, instead of saying hello user, I can say hello name. And you'll see in a second, this is going to use whatever variable or whatever piece of information gets passed into this method. So down here, if I want to give this a name, I can make an open and close parentheses. And in here, I could type a name. So I could say Mike. So now when we run our program, it's gonna say, hello, Mike. Essentially what's happening is the say hi method is specifying that you can give it a name. And down here, I can, when I call the method, I can give it that piece of information. You can also give these things multiple pieces of information. So I could also specify age. And then down here, we can incorporate that into our print statement. So I could say, hello, name, you are, and now we'll print out their age. So I can just say age. And essentially this will take in two parameters and it'll print them both out over there. So down here I can just specify the first parameter, Mike, and then I can specify the age. So we could say like, you know, 73 or something. And now it's going to say, hello, Mike, you are 73. And actually you'll see we're getting an error over here. And this is actually a uh, good little catch. So age, I'm actually passing in an integer. And whenever we wanna print out an integer inside of a print statement like this with strings, we always have to say age.2 underscore s. So that's why we were getting that error. And that's something that you always wanna watch out for in Ruby. So now when we run our program, it says, hello, Mike, you are 73. So that's pretty cool. We can pass this two pieces of information. But let's say that I didn't wanna pass this an age, right? Maybe I didn't know how old Mike was so I didn't wanna give it an age. Well, now when, we're, when we run our program, you'll see that we're getting an error, right? So because I didn't include an age when I called this, it's throwing an error. 
One way we can mitigate this in Ruby is we can actually give these variables default values. We can give these parameters default values. So I can come over here and say name is equal to no name. And we can just say age is equal to negative one. And essentially what's going to happen now is if I don't include an age in here, it's just going to print out the default. So it says, hello, Mike, you are negative one, right? If I wasn't including the name in here, it's just going to use both of those default values. So you'll see I'm not passing any parameters. And now it basically just says, hello, no name, you are negative one. So sometimes specifying default values can be a good way to control these methods. And really it depends. So in some methods, you're going to want whoever's calling them to give you certain pieces of information. But if those pieces of information are like optional, you can just give them default values like that. So that's the basics of working with methods. And there's actually one more thing we can talk about. And I'm going to talk about it in the next video. It's something called return types. Basically, we can give the method information and the method can give us information back. But for now, this is just the basics. And I hope you guys learned something about methods. In this tutorial, I want to talk to you guys about using returns in Ruby methods. So in the last tutorial, we talked a lot about writing methods. We looked at how we could give methods some information through parameters. In this tutorial, I want to talk to you guys about how methods can give us information back. So when I call a method inside of my program, that method will go off, it'll execute all its code, but then it can actually give us a piece of information or in some cases, multiple pieces of information back. And that can be really useful. So for the purposes of this tutorial, I want to show you guys how we can create a cube function. So in math, when you cube a number, you essentially take it to the third power. So if I was going to cube two, it'd be like two raised to the third power. So essentially it would just be two times two times two, right? So why don't we write a little method that's going to do that for us? So this method will cube a number. This is going to be pretty interesting. So down here, I'm just going to say def and we'll say cube. And we want to pass in one number. So I'm just going to specify that they need to pass in a num. And then down here, we're going to say end. What's cool about these methods is they can actually give us information back. So if I was going to cube the number, it would basically just be num times num times num, right? So that's essentially like all we would need to do to cube the number. But what's cool is when I call this cube function and I give it a number, so like I give it a two, if I was to print this out, so if I said puts cube two, this is actually going to print out num times num times num. So it's actually going to print out this answer over here. So let's take a look. You'll see here we're printing out eight. If I was to pass in like three over here, now we should get 27. So basically what's happening is we're calling this cube method and this cube method is giving us a value back. So when I call this, this is actually like ends up representing a value. It ends up representing the value that was given back to it. And if you want to give a value back, all you have to do is basically just specify it right here. So that's a really cool way that we can use these methods to get information back. But sometimes when you're working in these programs, it might not be super clear what value you want to return. So for example, I have num times num times num here. But if I put a four down here right below this, or even if I put like a string or whatever, let's put a five, you'll notice that now instead of returning num times num times num, this is actually going to return five. And that's because five is the last line inside of this method. It's basically like the last returnable piece of information that's inside of this method. So in situations like this, you can actually use what's called the return work keyword. So I can say return right before here. And even though there's a value after this, you'll see that this is going to return num times num times num anyway. So we're returning 27. And actually, here's the interesting part is any code that goes before this return keyword or that goes after this return keyword isn't going to get executed. So if I put a puts down here and I print it out, hello, when I run my program, you'll notice that it doesn't print out hello, like nothing is getting printed out. Basically, what's happening is when we use this return keyword, that's going to signal to Ruby that we're done with the method. So when Ruby sees this return keyword, it's basically going to jump and break out of the method and move on to the next line of code. So essentially, when you're using the return keyword, nothing after it is going to get executed. And that's just a little tip. 
So in addition to returning just normal numbers like we did over here, we can also return multiple pieces of information. And keep in mind, you can return any data type. It doesn't have to be like a number. Uh, it could be a string, it could be a Boolean, it could be anything. If I wanted though, I could return multiple numbers. So for example, I could return num times num times num. And then if I put a comma here, I could return another value. So I could return like 70. And now when I run my program, in addition to returning 27, you'll see that it's also returning 70. So I'm getting two pieces of information. And this is basically just returning like an array. So I could access each individual value that got returned by its index. So if I said Q3 square brackets one, that's just gonna give me 70. Now you wanna be careful when you're returning multiple values, just cause if you're returning like five or six different values, it can get a little bit confusing, especially for you know the code that's actually calling these functions. But for the most part, that can actually be pretty useful. So that's the basics of using that return keyword and also just returning values in general. This can be a super powerful way to, to make your methods a lot better. In this tutorial, I want to talk to you guys about using if statements in Ruby. Now, an if statement is a special structure that we can use in Ruby in order to help our programs to make decisions. They also help our programs to respond to the different information in the program. So if certain information has certain values, we can do certain things. If other information has different values, we can do different things. Basically, if statements make our programs a little bit smarter. So in this tutorial, I'm just gonna give you guys a basic overview of if statements, what we can do with them, how we can use them, and essentially just get you guys up and running with if statements. So over here, I just have this little text file, and uh, it actually has some common if statements that uh, human beings every day will encounter. So believe it or not, if statements also apply to like human beings. So let me show you guys a couple of these. The first one up here says, I wake up. If I'm hungry, I eat breakfast. So let's break this down a little bit. You'll see right here, we have a condition, right? If I'm hungry, this condition is either true or false, right? On the condition that they're hungry, then they're gonna go ahead and eat breakfast. If they're not hungry though, if this condition's false, then we're just gonna move on and they're not gonna eat breakfast, right? That's something that pretty much every morning, everybody is going to have to like ask themselves at some point. Here's another one, it says, I leave my house. If it's cloudy, I bring an umbrella. Otherwise, I bring sunglasses. So up here, you'll notice the same pattern. We have another condition, right? The condition is if it's cloudy. If that condition's true, if it is indeed cloudy, then they're gonna bring the umbrella. But if the condition's false, in other words, if it's not cloudy, then we're gonna come down here and we'll bring the sunglasses. So this one's a little bit different from the one up above because if this condition, if it's not cloudy, if this is false, then we're gonna do something else. All right, so I have one more down here at the bottom. It says, I'm at a restaurant. If I want meat, I order a steak. Otherwise, if I want pasta, I order spaghetti and meatballs. Otherwise, I order a salad. So this one's even more complex, right? We have our condition. It says, if I want meat, if that's true, we order the steak. Otherwise, if that's false, in other words, if you don't want meat, then we check another condition. So we're checking to see if we want pasta. If that's true, we get the spaghetti and meatballs. Finally though, if this is false, then we get the salad. So these are three basic if statements. And these are three if statements that we could actually use. And these are the types of things that we can do inside of our program. So we can specify certain conditions if those conditions are true, we can do certain things. If those conditions are not true, we can do other things. So I'm gonna show you guys basically how this works. Let's go over here to our Ruby file. So I'm just in my draft.rb file. And I'm gonna create a if statement. So I'm gonna show you guys how this works. The first thing we're gonna do before we actually make the if statement is just make a variable. So I'm just gonna call it isMail. And this is gonna be a Boolean variable. It's gonna tell us whether or not someone is male. So let's say this is a piece of information that we were storing inside of our program, like whether or not someone's male. So in my case, I am a male, so I'm gonna set it equal to true. So down here, we can actually make an if statement. So we can do something depending on the value of this variable is male. So I can say if, and over here, I wanna specify a condition. 
So remember, when we were looking at those text files, it was like, if it's cloudy, or if I'm hungry, or if I want meat, right? We were giving these those statements different conditions. In this case, we're gonna specify our own condition. So I'm gonna say, if is male. And inside of this condition, we need to include either a true or a false value. So Booleans are great with this because a Boolean can either have a value of true or false. So I can say, if is male, and then down here, I just wanna type out end. Now, whatever goes in between if and end is gonna get executed when is male is true. So over here, we could just put you are male, right? And so now, because is male is true, when I run my program, you'll see over here it says you are male. So the program's working. If I was to change is male to false, however, so I'm just gonna put false, now you'll see that this code isn't getting executed, so we're not printing anything out. That's the basics of an if statement, right? I can specify a condition. If the condition's true, then we'll execute the code down here. If the condition's false, we just skip over it. So I also wanna show you guys um, how we can use something called an else. So basically, what happens if we wanna do something when the person's not male, right? So we have it covered. If the person's male, we're gonna tell them they're a male. But what if they're not a male? Well, I can actually come down here and I can type out else. So I'm just gonna say else. And then again, below else, I'm gonna put code. So I could say puts you are not male. So now we basically have an if statement that will handle both of the possible scenarios. So if they're male, it'll tell them they're male. Otherwise, it'll tell them they're not male. So you'll see is male is false. And over here, we'll t we're telling them that they're not male. If I was to change this back to true, now it's gonna say you are male. So it's essentially able to react to the value of that variable. Let's make this if statement a little bit more complex. So why don't we add in another Boolean variable? I'm gonna say is tall. And we'll set is tall equal to, actually we'll set it to true initially. We'll also set this to true. So is tall will tell us whether or not a specific person or a specific entity you know, is tall. So what happens down here if we wanna do something when they're male and they're also tall? I can actually use another keyword in Ruby, which is called and. So I could say if is male and is tall. And basically what this is gonna do is it's going to execute the code inside of here when they're both male and they're also tall. So here we could say you are a tall male. And so now this code is only gonna execute when is male is true and is tall is true. So they're both true right now, let's run our program. It says you are a tall male. But if I was to set one of these equal to false, so for example, if I set in is tall equal to false, now it's not gonna tell us that we are a tall male anymore. So it's just gonna say you are not male. Although I guess we would have to change this down here. So we, we could say you are either not male or not tall or both. And so now it's telling us you're either not male or not tall or both because we know for a fact that they're not male and tall. So that's how we can, we can check two conditions. And in addition to using an and, I could also use another keyword called or. Basically, this will execute if they're either male or if they're tall. So only one of these variables has to be true now, right? This is gonna execute if they're male or if they're tall. So you'll see over here, is male is true and is tall is false but this is still gonna execute you are a tall male. And obviously we could change you know, whatever's getting printed out there, but hopefully you get the point. When we say and, both of the conditions have to be true. So if I was to say is male and is tall, these would both have to be true in order for this code to get executed. If I say or, only one of them needs to be true. Now both of them can still be true and we'll still execute that code, but only one of them has to be true. And if both of them are false, then we'll execute the code down here. So I'm gonna go back to is male and is tall. And let's say that I want to check to see the other conditions, right? So we're, we're already checking one condition. We're checking to see if they're male and they're tall. But what if we wanted to do something when they're male and they're not tall? Well, I can use something called an else if. And an else if is basically another keyword in Ruby that will check another condition. So I could say like ELSIF, and this just stands for else if. And I wanna type in another condition after this. 
So why don't we check to see if they're male? So I'm going to say else if is male. And I want to check to see that they're not tall. And the way that I can check to see if they're not something is I can use a exclamation point. So if I said and exclamation point is tall, this is basically saying not is tall. So when they're not tall, this is going to be true. And we're doing that using this exclamation point. It's called the negation operator. So down here we can put some more code. So I could just say puts you are a short male, right? Basically what's happening is it's going to check this if condition. So Ruby's going to check this if statement up here, if they're either not male or they're not tall. So in other words, if this whole thing is false, it's going to come down here and it's going to check this next condition. And if this is false, it's going to go down to the else. But if this is true, it'll execute the code inside here. And there's actually one more scenario that we could cover, which is when they're tall, but they're not a male. So I'm going to use another else if I'll say else if not is male. So I'm using that exclamation point and is tall. And if this is true, then we can just print out you are not male, but are tall. And then also down here, if the code inside of this else block is getting executed, then we're going to know that they're not male and not tall. So we can say you are not male and not tall. All right, so let's go ahead and run our program. So I'm going to set is male equal to true and is tall equal to true right off the bat just to start. So I'm running the program and you'll see it's able to handle that situation. It says you are a tall male. If I was to set is male equal to false though, our program is going to be able to handle that situation. So it's going to say you are not male, but are tall, right? Our program just by using these if statements was able to give us information based off of these values. If I was to make is tall false and is male true, it's going to be able to handle that. So it'll say you are a short male. If I make both of these false, it's going to be able to handle that as well. So it's going to say you are not male and not tall. So that's the basics of using if statements. You can see down here, I'm checking a condition. And in a lot of cases, you're going to want to check more than one condition. So you can use either and or or I'm checking these conditions. If the condition is true, then we'll execute the code down here. And by the way, you can put as much code down here as you'd want. I mean, I could put hundreds of lines of code if I wanted to. So I'm using the if statements and I'm using these else ifs and I'm using this else in order to catch all of these different scenarios. And these else ifs are really useful because you can check multiple conditions when other conditions are false. So that's the basics of working with if statements. There's actually some more stuff we can learn with these. Um, instead of just using Booleans like true and false, we can also use things called comparisons. And I'm going to be talking about that in the next tutorial. But for now, this has just kind of been a brief introduction into if statements in Ruby. In this tutorial, I want to talk to you guys some more about if statements. Specifically, we're going to be talking about using comparisons with if statements. So in any if statement, you're going to need a condition. And a condition is basically a true or a false value. One of the cool things about Ruby, though, is we can use a comparison in order to get a true or false value. So inside of our condition and our if statement, we can actually compare different values. And depending on the result of that comparison, we'll be able to either execute the code inside of the if statement or move on. So I'm going to show you guys how we can do this. It's really awesome and it's a super powerful feature. What I want to do in this tutorial is actually create a method. So I want to create a method called max. And this method is going to take three numbers as input. So it's going to take three parameters. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to return whichever number is the largest. So whichever number out of the three is the biggest, it'll basically return that back to the user. And this is a great example of a situation where you'd want to use comparisons inside of your if statements. So let's get started. I'm just going to come down here and we'll start making our function or our method. So I'm just going to say def and we're going to call it max and I'm going to make an open and close parentheses. Inside of this parentheses, I can specify any parameters that I want this method to take in. So I'm just going to say num1, num2, and num3. Basically, we're taking in three numbers. Now, down here, I'm just going to say end. And inside of this method, we have to devise an algorithm 
to figure out which number is the biggest, right? So inside of this method, we don't know which of these is the biggest, right? We have no idea. We have no idea what the user input into here. So we need to use an if statement in order to figure that out. So I can say if, now inside of this condition, I can actually compare two numbers. So I could say if num1 is greater than or equal to num2 and num1 is greater than or equal to num3. So remember, inside of an if statement, we need to put a condition here. And in the last tutorial, when we were using conditions, we were putting in true or false Boolean values. What you'll notice is when I compare two values, when I compare num1 and num2, this is actually gonna get resolved into a true or a false value. So this comparison is either true or it's false. Num1 is either greater than or equal to num2 or it's not. This is actually gonna end up being a Boolean value. This is gonna end up being true or false. Same thing over here. Num1 is either greater than or equal to num3 or it's not. It's a Boolean value. There's only two possible situations here. It's either true or it's false. We didn't actually have to put like true or false here. We were able to use a comparison in order to get a true or false value. So if num1 is greater than num2 and it's greater than num3, then we can just return num1 because we know that's the maximum number. Down here, I'm just gonna say else if, and I wanna check another condition. So I'm gonna check to see if num2 is greater than num1 or actually greater than or equal to num1 and num2 is greater than or equal to num3. So if num2 is bigger than num1 and num3, in other words, if the result of both of these comparisons is true, then we know that num2 is the biggest number. So we're just gonna return that. And finally, we can use an else statement. So I can use that else keyword. I can just say else. And down here, we can just return num3. Because if num1 isn't the biggest and num2 isn't the biggest, then we can be pretty sure that num3 is the biggest. So this is basically how we can use comparisons inside of our if statements. I also want you guys to notice that I was able to use this return keyword multiple times, right? So if this condition's true, we can just return the number. All right, so let's go ahead and run this function. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna call this function. I'm gonna say max. And I'm gonna pass it three numbers, one, two, and three. So. If I print this out, I print out the value that gets returned. Actually, I'm gonna put it. I should get a three back. So let's go ahead and run this. And actually you'll see I'm getting an error over here. I forgot to put in the end keyword. So down here, we just have to put in end. So you'll see we have an end keyword here and this ends off this if statement. We have another end keyword here and this ends off this function declaration. So that's something to keep in mind. You always wanna make sure that you're remembering to include this end keyword. You can see how easy it is to forget, I just forgot it. So I'm gonna run this program and you'll see we're getting three. So I passed it three numbers. If I was to make this middle number the largest, so we'll make it 20, now it should return 20. If I was to make the first number the largest, it's gonna return that. So we now have a valid working max function that will always tell us what the maximum number is. So I just wanna point this out one more time what was happening. Instead of putting a true or a false value in there, we actually indirectly put a true or a false value in there by making a comparison. And the result of that comparison is either gonna be true or false. There's no other situation, right? Num1's either bigger, greater than or equal to num2 or it's not. I'm also using something called a comparison operator. So this right here is a comparison operator. It's an operator that we can use to compare different values. This one is greater than or equal to, but there's also some other ones. So for example, uh, th probably the most basic is a double equals. And this basically means equal to. I can put a exclamation point in equal sign. This means not equal to. So this would be like num1 is not equal to num2. We can do a greater than sign, a greater than or equal to sign, a less than sign, a less than or equal to sign. And all of those are gonna allow us to compare different values. It's also important to note that in addition to just using numbers, you could also use strings here. So you can compare different strings. For example, I could compare two strings for equality. I could check to see if one string was equal to another string. And that's really a powerful way that we can use these if statements is by checking comparisons. 
a lot of times in your programs, you're gonna to wanna to compare different values and depending on the results of those comparisons, do different things. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about creating a better calculator in Ruby. If you've been following along with this course, then you'll know that in the beginning of the course, we created a very simple calculator. Basically, we allowed the user to input in two numbers. We took those numbers, added them together, and then printed out the answer onto the screen. So it was a really simple calculator, but in this tutorial, we're gonna be building an even better calculator. This calculator is not only gonna be able to add two numbers, but it'll be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide numbers. And will allow the user to choose which one they're gonna do. So this is gonna be pretty cool, and we're gonna use a lot of the stuff that we've learned up to this point in this course in order to do it. So the first order of business when we're creating our calculator is we need to get some input from the user. I need to get certain information, right? We need to get the first number, we need to get the second number, and then we need to get the operation that they wanna perform. So they would need to type in like two, and then a plus sign, and then a five, you know, something like that, basically. So let's go ahead and do that. Down here in my program, the first thing I wanna do is just print out a prompt. So I'm gonna say puts, and we're gonna print out enter first number. Basically, we're prompting them to enter in the first number. And then what I wanna do is I wanna take whatever number they enter, and I wanna store it inside of a variable. So I'm gonna create a variable called num1, and I'm just gonna set it equal to gets dot chomp. And this will basically just get the number that they enter in and remove the new line that gets entered when we click the enter key. So now that we've done this, we can do something similar for the other two pieces of information we need. The next, the next thing I wanna get is the operator. So I'm just gonna say enter operator. And basically this is gonna be like plus minus uh, division or multiplication. They're gonna enter in whatever they wanna do. So over here, instead of saying num1, we can just say op, and this is gonna stand for operator, and we're just gonna get whatever they input. Finally, I'm gonna ask them to enter the second number. So I'll say enter second number, and we're just gonna store this as num2. So essentially what we're doing is we're asking them to enter in the first number. Once they do that, we're asking them to enter in the operator, plus, minus, division, multiplication, subtraction, whatever. Then we're asking them to enter in the second number, and we're storing all of that information inside of variables. Now, there's one more thing we have to do. Remember, when the user enters in a number, in, when we ask them for input, it automatically gets converted into a string. So what we wanna do is we wanna convert the number that they enter from a string into a floating point number. So I'm just gonna say gets.chomp.2 underscore F, and this is gonna convert it into a floating point number. I'm gonna do the same thing down here, dot two underscore F. So now num1 and num2 are gonna be floating point numbers, assuming the user entered the number in correctly. All right, so once we do that, we actually need to do a couple other things. So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out if they want us to add the numbers, subtract the numbers, multiply the numbers, or divide the numbers, right? We have no way of doing that right now. So we need to figure out how can we figure out if they entered in a plus sign? How can we figure out if they entered in a minus sign? We need some way of figuring out what they entered. And this is a perfect scenario where we can use an if statement. Remember, an if statement allows us to respond to the different values in our programs. So if something has a certain value, we can do something. If it has another value, we can do something else. Perfect situation right here for an if statement. We can check to see if it's a plus sign, if it's a minus sign, if it's a division sign. And depending on the one it is, we can do something. Down here, I'm gonna create an if statement. I'm just gonna say if, and then we always wanna make sure that we end off the if statement down here. And up here, we're gonna put a condition. I'm gonna be checking a couple different conditions in this if block. The first thing I'm gonna do is check to see if it's equal to a plus sign. So I can check to see if op, and remember, op was the operator that got entered, is equal to, I'm gonna make those double equals, and over here, we'll just make a plus sign. So this is gonna be true if the operator they entered was a plus sign. So down here, what we can do is we can just say puts, and we'll just print out the answer. So I'm just gonna put num1 plus num2. Awesome. But there's also some other scenarios, right? The scenario where they enter a minus sign. So I can say else if, E-L-S-I-F, and I'm gonna say op is equal to minus sign. If that's true, 
we're just gonna put num1 minus num2. We can do the same thing for multiplication and division. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this. This will just make it go by a little quicker. And now instead of checking for subtraction, we'll check for division, which is just gonna be a forward slash. Finally, we can check for multiplication. So I'm gonna come down here and we'll just check for an asterisk and then down here we'll multiply them. So we're able to basically capture the four types of arithmetic, right? And respond to them appropriately. There's gonna be one more situation though that we wanna cover, which is if they enter in an operator that's not valid. So I'm just gonna say else. And remember the code inside of this else is only gonna get executed when none of the stuff up here is true. So when none of this stuff is true, in other words, if it's not plus sign, minus division or multiplication, we can just print out an error. We can say puts invalid operator. And that's basically gonna give them a little error message like, hey, you messed up, you didn't put in the right operator. So we've essentially written out our program. We get the three pieces of information. We check to see what operator they put in and we respond to it. So let's run our program and see how it works. Now remember, whenever we're running a program where we need to get input from the user inside of Ruby, we're gonna have to use the command line. So normally in this course, we've been using this little Atom plugin over here called Atom Runner but now we're gonna to have to use the command line. So I'm gonna come down here and I just have one inside of my Atom text editor. And I'm just gonna type Ruby draft.rb. That's the name of my file. And I'm just gonna click enter. And let's go ahead and use this little calculator. So it says enter the first number, we'll enter in a five. And it says enter the operator. So why don't we enter in a plus sign and it says enter the second number. So let's enter in a six. And when I click enter, we should hopefully get the correct answer. So you can see down here, five plus six is 11. So our program actually worked, that's awesome. All right, let's do it again. Let's try another one. Why don't we try to do some multiplication? So enter the first number, we'll enter in a five, and then we'll multiply it by 8.65. And let's see, oh wait, sorry, this is the operator. So multiplication, we'll multiply it by 8.65, and let's see what we get, 42.25. So yeah, that seems about right. So our calculator is functioning correctly. And let's try one more case where we enter an invalid operator. So I'm gonna run the program one more time. We'll enter in a four, and then we'll just enter in like a T as the operator and a five. And okay, so it tells us invalid operator. So we have a four function calculator. We've actually built an awesome four function calculator. What's cool about this calculator is it's able to respond to the operator that the user enters. And we can do that using if statements. So this is one of those situations where if statements are just gonna come in such handy because they're so useful, right? We can check all these different conditions. If one of them's true, we can do something. If another one's true, we can do something else. Um, so this is kind of bringing together, like getting user input and if statements into one single program, which ends up being a pretty awesome calculator. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about case expressions in Ruby. A case expression is actually just a special type of if statement that we can use to check a bunch of different conditions. So we could use an if statement to check, you know, to see if a bunch of different things are equal to other things or to check the values of different variables. But sometimes when there's a bunch of different things that we need to check, we can use something called a case expression and it actually makes it a lot easier. So we're gonna be creating a method in this tutorial, which is going to map day abbreviations to day names. So for example, each day of the week has an abbreviation, like Monday is M-O-N and that gets mapped to Monday, right? Tuesday is T-U-E and that gets mapped to Tuesday. Wednesday is W-E-D, that gets mapped to Wednesday, etc. right? The abbreviations get mapped to actual full days of the week. So I wanna write a method that can take as a parameter one input and it's gonna be an abbreviation and it's gonna take that abbreviation and it's gonna spit out the actual name of the day. So if we pass in an M-O-N, it'll spit out Monday. If we pass in a FRI, it'll spit out Friday, right? And that's basically gonna allow us to convert these abbreviations into the actual days of the week. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just gonna define this method. So I'm just gonna say def, and we need to also include an end over here and a method name. So why don't we call our method get day name? So this is gonna be called get day name, 
And inside of here, we're gonna pass the abbreviation. So I'm just gonna call this day. And day is gonna represent the three letter abbreviation of the specific day, right? Makes sense. All right, so down here, what we need to do is we need to convert day into the actual day name. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create a variable and we'll just call it day name. And we're gonna store whatever the day name ends up being inside of this variable. So I'm just gonna set this initially equal to the empty string. And then down here, right before we end off the method, I'm gonna return day name. So our mission inside of this method now is to give this day name variable the value of the correct day, right? We need to give it the name of the day that corresponds to this abbreviation. So one way that we could do this would be using an if statement, right? So I could come down here and, you know, hopefully at this point you guys are familiar with if statements. I could say like if day is equal to MON, right? If day is equal to MON, then we can set the day name equal to Monday makes sense. But there's also a bunch of other conditions we have to check. So if that's not true, we can check to see if the day is equal to Tuesday. And if that's true, then we can set the day name equal to Tuesday. So for each day of the week, I can make a different else if, right? I can say else if day is equal to Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But here's the problem. This is going to get really tedious and really messy really fast, right? Having to create seven different if statements and, you know, seven different else blocks checking seven different conditions is going to be really difficult and tedious. And that's why Ruby has something called the case expression. And essentially what the case expression does is it allows us to take a scenario like this where we're comparing the same value to a bunch of different values and put it into a structure of its own. So in this situation, in every single one of these conditions, we're comparing the day variable equal to another value, right? In this condition, we're comparing it to Monday. Down here, we're comparing it to Tuesday. We could also compare it to Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's the same comparison with a different value. In a situation like that, case expressions are golden. They're gonna help us out so much. So I'm gonna get rid of this if block, and over here, we're gonna set up a case expression. So the way that I do this is just by typing out case, and now I need to give this something. So we're gonna give this the value that we wanna compare to a bunch of different values. In our case, it's just day, right? Because I wanna compare day to mun, I wanna compare day to two, like T-U-E, I wanna compare it to W-E-D, T-H-U. I wanna compare it to all the day abbreviations. So we're gonna need to end this off. Now inside of here, I can create something called a when statement. And a when statement will basically do something when day is equal to a certain value. So I can say when, and now I can compare day to something. So I could say when mun, and basically what me this means is when day is equal to mon, then down here we're gonna do something. So I can just put some code down here. So what I wanna do is set day name equal to Monday, because now we know they're trying to get Monday. I can make another when, so I could say when T-U-E, we could say day name is equal to Tuesday, right? And so basically what we're doing is we're checking to see if day is equal to Monday, and if it is, then we'll do this. If day is equal to Tuesday, then we'll do this, etc. So I could make one of these for every single day of the week. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, and then we'll meet back here and we'll talk about what happened. All right, so I went ahead and created one of these for every day of the week. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these here. And each one of these is doing something when a different condition is met. So when it's W-E-D, we're setting day name to Wednesday. When it's F-R-I, we're setting day name to Friday, etc. So essentially we're able to create like a complex if else structure, but without having to like actually write all of it out. We can just say like when, and it's automatically gonna check this value with the value up here. So this can be really useful, but there's actually one thing that we want to account for. There's gonna be situations where the user enters in an invalid day abbreviation. So if the user enters in a valid abbreviation like S-U-N or S-A-T, we can cover that, right? But what happens if they enter in something invalid? So what happens if they pass a parameter into this get day name method that isn't an actual valid abbreviation. Well, we can use something called the else keyword. And the else keyword is a lot like the else keyword in if statements. I can just say else. 
And now anything that I put in here is gonna execute when none of these guys up here are true. So I could say down here else day name is equal to invalid abbreviation, right? So I'm basically telling them, hey, you put an invalid abbreviation in here. So this is gonna get executed when there isn't a valid abbreviation. All right, so essentially what I'm doing is in each of these scenarios, I'm giving day name a different value. Then down here at the bottom of our method, I'm just returning day name. So this is a fully functional method. Hopefully everything works. Why don't we come down here and test it? So I'm gonna go ahead and just print out the answer that we get back. So I'm gonna say puts, and then it's just called get day name. And we wanna pass this an abbreviation. So I'm gonna pass this MON for Monday, right? And when I pass it this, and we run our program, you'll see over here, we print out Monday. So our program is giving us back the correct answer. If I typed in SAT down here, then we should get back Saturday, just like that. If I typed in THU, then we're gonna get back Thursday. So you can see we're getting back the correct value. If I typed in something invalid, so if I typed in like DOG, like dog, now it should yell at us. So it's gonna say invalid abbreviation. And we were able to do this whole thing while keeping it nice and clean and nice and simple. Like this whole thing only took me, you know, less than a minute to write out. And I was covering all of these different situations. So this can be extremely useful when you want to check a single value like a day against a bunch of different values and do different things depending on the situation. So definitely consider using case expressions. Here's the thing. These aren't going to be appropriate in every situation. These are appropriate for one specific situation, right? Where we're checking the same value against a bunch of different values. But that situation is very common. So when it does come up, don't be afraid to use case statements. They'll make your life a lot easier. In this tutorial, I want to talk to you guys about working with while loops in Ruby. So a while loop is basically a structure that we can use inside of our Ruby programs, which will allow us to loop through a particular block of code a specific number of times. So I can basically like write out my while loop and I can put some code in there. And as long as a certain condition remains true, I'll keep looping over and executing that same code inside that while loop. There's a lot of situations in Ruby where we're gonna to wanna to use loops. We're gonna to wanna to do something continuously until we need to stop. And so while loops are a great way to do that. And in this tutorial, I just wanna give you guys a, a broad overview of while loops. We'll look at like the most basic type of while loop you can write. We'll just talk about the core concepts behind them. So over here, I can actually create a while loop. And the first thing I wanna do is actually make a variable. And this isn't you know 100% necessary when working with while loops but you'll see how this variable comes in in a second. So I'm just gonna call the variable index and I'm gonna set it equal to one. So we have a variable index and it has a value of one. And down here, I can actually create my while loop. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just type out while and then what I need to do is I need to specify a condition. And you always wanna make sure that you end these off. So I'm just gonna put an end down here. Now, here's basically how while loops work all of the code in between while and end, so all the code inside of here that we're gonna put inside there is gonna get continually executed. So it's gonna keep getting looped over and keep getting executed as long as this condition is true. So as long as the condition that we specify right there is true, then we're gonna keep executing the code inside of this loop. So over here, I can actually specify a condition. So I'm gonna say while index, is less than or equal to five. So essentially what I'm saying is while index is less than or equal to five, I'm gonna keep looping through the code inside of here. And actually what I can put in here, we can just put you know whatever code we wanna keep looping over. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type puts and I'm gonna print out the value of index. So I'm gonna say puts index. And then down below here, I'm actually gonna increment the value inside of index. So I'm gonna say index is equal to index plus one. So basically every time through this loop, I'm printing out the index and then down here, I'm incrementing the index. And actually I want to show you guys something that's cool. We can do in Ruby. I have here index is equal to index plus one, but I can actually, instead of saying that I can just say index plus equals one. And whenever I say plus equals, you can also use minus equals um, as well. 
this is basically just going to add the number over here to index. So this is going to add one to index. So that's kind of a little shorthand we can use in Ruby. But back to the while loop, this is going to keep looping through the code inside of here as long as the index is less than or equal to five. So let's think about what's going to happen here. Actually, let, let me just show you guys. So why don't we execute this code? I'm going to run the program and you'll see over here, I'm actually printing out values between one and five. So I'm printing out one, two, three, four, and five. So maybe this is what you expected to happen. Maybe it's not what you expected to happen. Either way, I'm going to walk you guys through exactly what happened. So over here, it says while index is less than or equal to five. So remember, we're going to keep looping through this loop as long as that's true. So here's how the execution of this program goes. Ruby creates this index variable, gives it a value of one. The first thing Ruby does when it gets to this while loop is it checks this condition. If this condition's true, then it's going to start looping through. So in our case, this condition is true, right? So Ruby's going to go ahead. It's going to print out the index and it's going to add one to it. Once Ruby has finished executing the code inside the while loop, the next thing it's going to do is go back up here to the top of the while loop and it's going to check this condition again. So every time Ruby goes through this loop, every time it loops through the code, right? It's going to go back up and it's going to check the condition again. So every time through the loop, we're constantly checking the condition. So in this case, we incremented I, we incremented the index. So the index is now equal to two, which is less than or equal to five. So we're good to go, right? The condition's true. So now we'll execute all of the code inside of here again. And then again, we're going to come back up and check the condition. So every single time we're going and we're checking that condition. Eventually, index is going to be equal to six, right? We're going to get to a point where, you know, index was equal to five. So we printed it out and then we added one to it. So now index is equal to six. We're going to loop all the way back up here. And suddenly this condition is going to be false. And when this condition is false, we're going to break out of the loop. So we're not going to execute it anymore. And we're just going to move on to the next line of code. So that's basically how while loops work. We specify a condition. As long as that condition is true, we move on. And that's how we can get this output right here. So for example, if I was to change this to like eight, now we're going to print out one through eight because the condition is only false when we get to nine, right? So we're printing out eight times essentially. So this is extremely useful. There's tons of situations where we're going to want to use while loops like this. Now I want to point out one potential problem that you're going to have with while loops. And it's basically called an infinite loop. And an infinite loop is a situation where the condition up here never becomes false. So it just loops through infinitely. And this is something that could actually mess up your programs quite a bit. So you always want to make sure that when you're writing a while loop that eventually the condition up here is going to be false. Now in certain special circumstances, you actually want to use an infinite loop, but I'd say for most cases, uh, especially as a beginner, you're not going to want an infinite loop. So it's just something to keep in mind. But this is sort of the basics of a while loop. We're specifying a condition. As long as that condition is true, we're going to keep looping through whatever code is inside of here. So like I said, there's tons of ways for us to use this. And in the next lesson, we're actually going to build a program where we're going to use a while loop in order to build a little game. So stick around for that. That's going to be pretty fun. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk to you guys about building a guessing game in Ruby. So we're actually going to build a little game and it's basically a game where the user can try to guess a secret word. So we'll continually prompt the user to guess a secret word. And if they get it right, then they'll get a success message like, hey, you got the word right. If they get it wrong, then we'll let them keep guessing. So they'll be able to keep guessing uh, what the word is until they get it right. So this should be kind of cool. And it, this will show us how we can use something like a while loop um, in order to build a little game. So down here, the first thing I want to do is create a couple variables. The first variable I want to create is going to be the word that the user has to guess. So remember, we're creating a guessing game. So we need to store a variable that has the word in it, right? So I'm going to say secret underscore word. And this is just going to store that secret word. And I'm just going to set this equal to draft. So, you know, this could really be anything you want, whatever the secret word is going to be for our game. And finally, I want to create one more variable. This is going to be called guess. And we're just going to set guess equal to the empty string for now. So I have two variables, secret word and guess. And now that I have these two variables, I basically want to create a while loop. 
And I'm gonna create a while loop that's gonna continually loop through and ask the user for input. So I'm just gonna say while, and over here we need to specify a condition. So again, this while loop is gonna keep asking the user to input the secret word. And as long as they don't get the secret word right, we're gonna keep asking them. So I'm basically gonna say while guess is not equal to secret word. So as long as the user's guess isn't equal to the secret word, we're gonna keep looping. So down here, what I wanna do is print out a prompt. So I'm just gonna say puts, and we're just gonna say enter your guess. So this is gonna prompt the user to enter a guess. And what we wanna do now is we wanna store whatever the user guesses inside of this guess variable. So I'm just gonna say guess is equal to gets.chomp. And remember, chomp is basically just gonna get rid of that new line at the end of whatever the user enters. So essentially what's happening here is while they, the user hasn't guessed correctly, while their guess isn't equal to the secret word, we're just gonna prompt them again for the guess and the guess is just gonna get equal to whatever the user types in. So. Eventually what's gonna happen is they're going to guess the word correctly. And when they do guess the word correctly, then this condition's gonna be false. So we're gonna come down here and we'll basically just print out a success message. So I'll just say like, puts you one. All right, so this is a pretty simple program, but you'll see this actually allows us to build a guessing game inside of Ruby. So whenever we are getting input from the user in Ruby, we always wanna do it through the terminals or through the command line. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up my command line down here and I'm gonna run our program. So it's just called draft.rb. So I'm just gonna type Ruby draft.rb and this will start executing our program. So down here you can see it's asking us to enter a guess. So I'm gonna come down here and I'll enter a guess. So why don't we just enter in some nonsense. So you'll notice as long as I don't guess the word correctly, as long as I'm not entering in the correct guess, the program keeps prompting me to enter a guess, right? It keeps asking me to do that. But here's the thing, if I was to come down here and actually enter in the guess correctly, so if I typed in like draft, now we should get a success message. So when I click enter, you'll see it says you won because we entered in the secret word correctly. So obviously this is a very simple program, but it actually works pretty well and it does everything that we want it to do. This is a very simple game. And one of the problems with this game is that the user gets unlimited guesses. They can keep guessing the word forever until they get it. And that's not the makings of a good game. What would be better is if we imposed some sort of a guess limit on them. So they can only guess the word a certain number of times, otherwise they lose the game. So let's go ahead and see if we can add that functionality into our program. In order to do that, I'm gonna to have to create a couple more variables. The first variable I wanna create is gonna be called guess count. And guess count is gonna basically tell us how many times the user has tried to guess the word. So I'm gonna create a variable guess underscore count, and I'm just gonna set this equal to zero because initially the user won't have guessed, so the guess count will just be zero. Now, down here, every time the user guesses, I want to increment the guess count. Right, so down here, basically this code means that the user has tried to guess the word. So every time they do that, I wanna increment the guess count. I just wanna say guess count plus equals one. And this will add one onto the guess count. So every time they guess, we're gonna increment that. And I wanna create two more variables. The first one is gonna tell us how many guesses the user can actually take. So it's gonna be called guess limit. And why don't we just say the user has three guesses? So three strikes and you're out. So if they can't guess the word in three tries, then they're gonna lose the game. All right, finally, I wanna create one more variable. And this variable is gonna tell us whether or not the user is out of guesses. So I'm just gonna say out of guesses is equal to false. Because initially the user is gonna have three guesses, right? When the user reaches their guess limit, we're gonna set this out of guesses variable equal to false, and then we'll be able to tell the user like, hey, you lost the game. All right, so now that we've created these variables, I'm just gonna come down here and inside of this while loop, we wanna modify a couple things. 
The first thing I want to do is every time we ask the user to guess the word, I want to make sure that they're not out of guesses. In other words, I want to make sure that they haven't reached the guess limit. So I'm going to use an if statement to do that. Inside this while loop, the first thing we're going to do before we do anything else is just say if, and we want to check to make sure that the guess count is less than the guess limit. So I'm going to if guess count is less than guess limit. In other words, if the guess count is less than the guess limit, then we know they have guesses left, right? We know that they have a certain number of guesses left and they should be able to keep guessing the word. So if this is true, then I want to allow them to guess the word. So I'm just going to take all this code and we're going to move it up here, all right? So if the guess count is less than the guess limit, if they have more guesses, then we're going to do all of this. Otherwise though, in the situation where the guess count isn't less than the guess limit, then we know for a fact that the user is out of guesses, right? If they, that means they have no more guesses. So inside of this else statement, what I want to do is I want to set that out of guesses variable equal to true. And basically this will tell our program like, Hey, the user's done. They're out of guesses, right? We checked to see if they were eligible for another guess. And if they weren't, then we're going to say out of guesses is equal to true because they ran out of guesses. All right. There's one more thing we have to do inside of this while loop and we have to actually modify the while condition. So over here, you can see we have our little condition and we're going to keep looping while the guess is not equal to the secret word. But now that we've imposed the guess limit, there's actually one more situation that's going to cause us to stop looping, which is when the user's out of guesses. So I want to say, I want to keep looping as long as the guess is not equal to the secret word and as long as the user is not out of guesses. So, and not out of guesses. So we're going to keep looping through this loop. We're going to keep asking the user to input information. We're going to keep doing all the code down here as long as the guess is not equal to the secret word. And as long as the user is not notice, I'm using this exclamation point here out of guesses, right? So, now we have our while loop set up, right? We're able to loop through here as long as the user has guesses left. There's one more thing we have to do down here. So before we just put you one, right? Before, if the user exited out of that while loop, that means they guessed the word correctly. So we knew for a fact that they won. But now that we're imposing the guess limit, there's actually two situations where the user could exit out of the loop. The first situation is where they got the word right, in which case they won. The second situation though, is that they ran out of guesses. And if they ran out of guesses, we don't want to tell them they won. We want to tell them they lost. So we can actually check to see which situation caused that loop to end. I can just say if, and I want to check to see if they're out of guesses. And if they are out of guesses, then I'm just going to print out you lose. But otherwise, if they're not out of guesses, that means that they were able to guess the word correctly within the certain number of guesses. So they win. So this is our basic program and let's go ahead and test it and see if it works. So again, I'm going to open up the terminal and over here, I'm just going to run the program and actually it looks like I'm getting an error here. Yeah. So I forgot to put an end statement down here. I always forget to do that. So always make sure that you put an end statement down here and now we'll be able to execute our program correctly. So here we go. All right, so it says enter a guess. So why don't we just try to lose the game? So I'm just going to enter in one guess, two guesses. Now I'm on my third guess. So this is my last try. If I don't get the secret word on this try, I'm going to lose the game. So we're going to not get it. And it's going to say you lose. So the program is smart enough to figure out that not only did we run out of guesses, but also that we lost. So let's try it now, but we'll try to win the game. So over here, I'm going to make a random guess, another random guess. So now we're on our last try. It's our last chance to get the guess. I'm going to type in the secret word, which is draft. And now the program is going to tell us, Hey, you won. So we were able to win the game because we guessed within the guess limit. So that is basically this program. I know this is a lot of code, so I'm just going to step through it with you guys one more time, just to kind of do a, a broad overview of what we did. That way you can get a better idea of what's going on. So we have these two variables, secret word and guess. And these two are pretty obvious, right? The secret word stores the word that the user needs to guess. 
guess is going to end up storing what the user guesses each time through that loop. Right, so we're gonna keep looping through this loop as long as the guess is not equal to the secret word. And down here, we're basically gonna store whatever the user guesses inside of this guess variable. That was like the basic game that we built. Then we added these three new variables, guess count, guess limit, and out of guesses. Guess count is basically gonna tell us how many times the user has guessed. And so every time the user guesses, we're gonna come down here, we're gonna increment it, right? Guess limit is gonna tell us how many times the user can guess. In other words, how many guesses they have available to them. And you'll see down here, we're using this if statement. So we're checking to see if the guess count is less than the guess limit. If that's true, if they still have some guesses left, then we're gonna execute all this code, we'll let them guess. Otherwise though, we're gonna use this out of guesses variable and we're gonna set it equal to true. That's gonna tell our program that the user's out of guesses. Up here, we also added another condition inside of our while loop. So we're saying while the guess isn't equal to the secret word and while the user's not out of guesses. So that's going to allow us to control what happens in this loop. Then finally down here, we're checking to see if they're out of guesses. So down here, there was two situations. The first situation was when the user ran out of guesses, so they lost the game. And if that's the case, we're just gonna print out you lose, otherwise we'll print out you won. So that's the basics of building our guessing game. So now your homework is to go off and build a guessing game of your own. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about for loops in Ruby. Now a for loop is basically a structure in Ruby that allows us to loop through a specific collection. So that could be a collection like an array, it could also be a collection of numbers basically allows us to loop through a connection, a collection and for each item inside the collection, we can do something. And actually in this tutorial, we're not just gonna be talking about for loops, we're gonna be talking about a broad range of different loops and looping structures, which we can use to loop through different things. Essentially in Ruby, there's a lot of different ways we can do the same thing. And I'm gonna be showing you guys a bunch of different ways to do essentially the same thing. So the first thing I wanna show you guys is I have this array set up up here and it's basically just called friends and it has a bunch of items in it. Uh, you know, basically just a list of someone's friends. And I wanna show you guys how we can use a for loop to actually loop through all of the items inside of this friends array. Now remember, if I wanted to access a specific item, I could just say friends and then pass an index in. So if I said friends one, this is gonna print out Karen onto the screen, right? So that's kind of how I can access an individual element, but I can also use something called a for loop and I can say for friend in friends. And then down here, I also wanna end this off. So I'm just gonna put end and inside of this little for loop, I can just say puts friend. And what this is gonna do is it's actually gonna print out all of the friends inside of this friends array. So now when I run this program, you'll see we're printing out all of the values inside of that array. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm saying for and I'm specifying the name of a variable. And on every iteration of this for loop, this friend variable is gonna represent a different friend. So on the first iteration, it'll represent Kevin. On the second iteration, it'll represent Karen, etc. And I could actually name this whatever I wanted. So I could just say element, and down here, I could print out element and it doesn't actually matter. So it's all gonna be the same. So that's a really easy way that you could loop through uh, all the elements in an array. So for each element inside the array, you could basically do something. And really friends could be, this could refer to any collection inside of uh, Ruby. This is basically just a general way to loop through a collection of elements. So this can be really useful. When we're dealing with arrays, there's also another way that we could do essentially this same thing. So instead of having this for loop, I could just say friends.each and I can say do, and then I wanna make it two like little vertical bars right here. And I'm just gonna say, I pass in the same thing as we did before, like a variable. And this variable is gonna represent a specific friend on each iteration of this loop. So then down here, again, we can just say end. And over here, I can just print out friend. And so now it's doing the same thing as we did before. We're printing out 
each one of the friends that was inside of that array. And again, I could, this doesn't have to be friend, this could be anything I want. So that's basically how we could loop through like an array a couple different ways. Um, there's also another thing we could do, we could loop through a range of numbers. So I could specify that I wanna go through a loop and go through the code a specific number of times. So I could come down here and I could say like, for index in let's say zero to five, and I wanna do something, so I could just print out the index. This is basically just gonna loop through this loop five times. So you'll see over here, it prints out, actually I guess it looped through six times. So it prints out zero, one, two, three, four, and then five. So it's gonna loop through from zero to five. And a lot of times, in a lot of cases, you're gonna want to go through a loop a specific number of times and you can do it just like that. There's also another thing we could do, we could say, like we could specify a number here. So I could say like six, and I could say dot times do, and inside of these vertical bars, I can just say like index. And again, this doesn't have to be called index. This can be called anything we want. And here it's the same thing. So this is going to loop through something six times. So over here, you were printing out zero through five. So these are all basically different ways that we can loop through other collections or we can loop through something a specific number of times in Ruby. And this can come in handy a lot. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about building an exponent method in Ruby. One of the things I wanted to show you guys was how we can use something like a for loop in order to write a little method. And I think one method that could be kind of cool to see how we might be able to write it would be an exponent method. So an exponent method would basically take two numbers. It would take a base number and it would take a power number. And then it would basically take the base number to the power number. So if we passed in like a two and a three, then this would basically give us like two raised to the third power. That's essentially like what this method is gonna do. And let's just go ahead and create it. So I'm just gonna say def, and why don't we just call this POW for like power. So it'll take a number to a specific power. And then inside of these parentheses, we actually wanna have this method accept two parameters as input. So we want the base num and we also want the pow num. So the base number and that's gonna be taken to the power number, okay? All right, let's end off this method. Now, inside of here, we need to figure out how can we actually do this? You know, how can we take the base number to the power number? And my solution would be to use a for loop. So the first thing I'm gonna do actually is create a variable. So I'm just gonna call this result and I'm gonna set this equal to one. And then down here, right before uh, the end of the function, we're just gonna return it. So I'll just return result. So ultimately this variable result is going to represent the value of the base number taken to the power number. So let's use a for loop. Essentially what I wanna do is I want to multiply the base number by result pownum times, if that makes sense. So let's flesh out this for loop and then we'll kind of see how it's gonna work. So I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say pownum dot times do. And basically what we're gonna do now is we can actually just pass this an index. Now I don't know if we're gonna actually use this index but it might be good just to pass it in anyway. And down here, I'm just gonna end this off. Inside of this little loop here, we're basically just gonna multiply result times the base num. So I'm just gonna say result is equal to result times base num. So essentially what's happening is pownum dot times do index. This is essentially just gonna loop through the code inside of here, pownum times. So if pownum is three, we're gonna loop through this code three times. If pow num is 10, we're gonna loop through this code 10 times. And every single time we go through this code, we're gonna multiply result times the base num. So the first time through the loop, it's just gonna be result, which is one times base num. So result's gonna end up just being base num. Second time through, it's gonna end up being like base num squared. Third time through, it's gonna end up being like base num cubed. So this is essentially how we can go ahead and write this method. Now, it's important to note that this is only gonna work for positive number exponents. So if pow num is a negative number, then this method's actually not gonna work. Um, but just for our purposes in this tutorial, let's just assume that we're always gonna use a positive exponent. So once we've multiplied result times the base num as many times as we need to, then we can just return it. So believe it or not, this is actually all we need for this method to work. 
So let's go ahead and call this method and we'll see what we get. So down here, I'm actually just gonna print this out. So I'll just print out POW and why don't we take two to the third power, okay? So let's run this and you can see over here, we get eight. So two cubed is eight. Let's try another one. Why don't we do four cubed? So now we should get 64, good. Let's do five squared. So we should get 25 and we do. So looks like this method's working. So again, this is gonna work for uh, positive number exponents. Negative number exponents, uh, this won't handle it. But for our purposes, this kind of demonstrates how we can use a little for loop, or in this case, we're just saying pound dot times in order to loop through something a certain number of times. And this can be extremely useful when we wanna do something like this. And also I just wanna point out over here, I had kind of stored this variable index, um, but you don't actually have to do that. And in this case, uh, we don't need it inside of this method, but sometimes it's good to just have it there. So that's to kind of give you an idea of like a situation where we might be able to use one of these looping structures in order to like perform a function. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about comments in Ruby. A comment is basically a little line of code that Ruby is actually gonna ignore. So a lot of times when we're writing our Ruby programs, there's gonna be situations where we want to leave like little notes or really just little comments inside of our files. And a comment is exactly that. It's just a little line of code, a little line of text that is meant to be read by humans. So if you're writing a Ruby file, you can leave a little comment and then when you come back later, you can read the comment or another developer who's looking at the file can read the comment and you can basically communicate information that's outside of just the actual code in the file. And there's a lot of situations where comments are gonna be useful. The basics of making a comment is you, you essentially go to a line of code and you can use this hashtag symbol and anything that you put after this hashtag symbol is gonna be in the comment. So you notice that my text editor is actually styling this a little bit differently. So if I was just to come down here and type out some random text, you can see that this is actually gonna get rendered by the program. But if I put random text over here after this hashtag, this is gonna be considered a comment. So I can basically write any plain text over here and when I run the program, you'll notice that nothing gets printed out you know, that's inside of this comment block. So like I said, comments are really useful for leaving little messages or little reminders uh, inside of your programs. You can also put comments after lines of code. So for example, here we have just a line of code. If I wanted after this line of code, I could put my hashtag and I could type a comment after here. And this is something that you'll see a lot in programs, like people will include comments either after lines of code or directly above lines of code. And a lot of times people will use comments in order to like describe what a line of code is doing. So I could say like this line prints text. So obviously, you know, it's pretty obvious what this line is doing, but if I wanted, I could put a comment there. Another thing that comments are used for is commenting out code. So there's gonna be certain situations when you're programming where you might want to run your program, but without a specific line of code. So maybe you have like this whole you know, big method and you wanna see what your program would be like without a specific line. Well, one thing you could do would be just to erase the line of code, right? You could get rid of it and you could go ahead and you could run the file and you know, basically the code's gone. But the problem with that is you have to physically delete the line of code. A better way would be just to come over here and right before the line of code, we could put a comment there. And this is what's called commenting out a line of code. And a lot of times developers will use this to basically temporarily like disable a line of code. So now when I run the program, we're not printing out comments or fun anymore because it's commented out. And the great thing is when I want this line of code back, I can just get rid of the comment and we're back in business. So, you know, really a comment is just kind of like open for business. Like whatever you want to do with it, whatever you, you know, you think you can accomplish with a comment, you can go ahead and do that. Um, a lot of times people will also put comments on multiple lines. So you'll see some people, they'll have like, you know, line one of a comment and then down here, they'll make another hashtag, they'll have line two. Uh, this is one way that you can put comments on multiple lines. And honestly, this would probably be the recommended way, like the most you know, Ruby-esque way to do it. There is another way that we can do this though. Um, so yeah, like I said, normally with these hashtags, like it only applies to the, the one line, right? But if you wanted, you could create a comment block. And all you have to do is just say equals begin, and then wherever you want the comment block to end, you can just say equals end. 
And it's important to know that these can't have any white space before them. So you see if I put waste, white space there, it uh, disables the comment. So down here you can just type whatever you want inside the comment and it'll be rendered as a comment. But like I said, I think um, probably a cleaner way to do it is just to put a hashtag on every line, especially you know if you're moving to other programming languages, a lot of other programming languages will do stuff like this. So you know it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, one final thought about comments, um, you wanna use comments only when they're absolutely necessary. Uh, you know, comments, if you have too many of them and they're too active in the document, a lot of times they can be a little bit distracting. Generally, your goal should be to write code that is as readable and clean as possible so that you don't need comments to explain it. But a lot of times a comment can come in handy. So if there's a situation where you think you need a comment, don't be afraid to put one in. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you the basics of reading from an external file in Ruby. Now, one of the useful things we can do with Ruby is we can actually read from external files that are on our computer. So if I had like a file that was on my computer somewhere, I could actually read from that file inside of my Ruby program. So I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. I actually created a text file over here. It's in the same directory as this draft.ruby file. It's called employees.txt. So I'm gonna open that up. And you can see over here, it's just a very simple text file of employees. So these might be like employees at an office or you know whatever. We have you know the name and then we have the position. So Jim is in sales, Andy's in sales, Creed is in quality assurance. Basically it just says their names and then it says what they do, so their jobs. So this is a, a, you know, an example of maybe a text file that you might wanna read from inside of your Ruby files. So I'm gonna show you guys how we can read from this file. Over here in my program, I have to use a special command. So I'm just gonna say file dot open. And now I'm gonna make an open and closed parentheses. And so inside of this open and closed parentheses, I wanna give this a couple different parameters. The first one is gonna be the name of the file. In my case, I have this file stored in the same directory as this Ruby file. So I can actually just put in the name of the file. So I can say employees.txt. But if this isn't in the same directory as the Ruby file, you're gonna have to include either a relative path in here. So for example, if it was in a directory called like files, I could say forward slash files um, or you know files forward slash or you're gonna to have to include an absolute path that starts at your hard drive. So that would be, if you're on Windows, it could be something like C, uh, you know, users, whatever. Um, so basically some sort of path to the file or if it's in the same directory, you can just put the file name. And we also need one more parameter in here, which is gonna be the mode that we want to open the file in. So when you open a file in Ruby, you can actually open it in a couple different modes. And there's maybe like six or seven different modes that you can open files in. Um, the one we're gonna be using is called read. So I'm just gonna type an R in here, and that's gonna tell Ruby that all we wanna do is read the file. So we don't wanna modify it, we don't wanna to write to it, we don't wanna overwrite it, we just wanna read it. And now what I can do is I can say do, and over here I can make two open vertical bars and I'm just gonna say file. And basically what this is doing is it's storing this file that we just opened inside of this file variable. So I now have a variable called file which will represent the file that we just opened. And basically what I wanna do is I wanna come down here and down below here I basically just want to say end. So this is one way that we can open up a file. And I think for a beginner, this is probably the easiest way to do it. So you just say file.open the name of the file, the mode in our case R, do, and then this is now gonna store this file inside of this variable. So whatever we wanna do with this file, we can do inside of here. And the reason that we need this end block is because this end block is gonna signify when we're done working with the file. And when we're done working with the file, it's just gonna go ahead and close the file. So we're not gonna be using it anymore. We're not gonna have it open anymore. So this is gonna be good just as a beginner, just to kind of you know play around with uh, working with and reading from files. So inside of here, we can use this file variable that we created over here, and we can actually do some stuff. So the first thing I could do would be just to print this out. So I could uh, just say puts file, and now you'll see over here on the screen, it's printing out like all of this information. And this is essentially like some like metadata about our file. Um, it's basically like how it's stored in Ruby. 
But if we want, we can read the file. So I can say puts file.read. And now we're going to get all the information in the file. So you see we're printing out all the different names, all the different employees from our file. So read is basically just like you're reading the entire file. And if you want, you could use any sort of, you know, string methods on this. I mean, this is basically just giving us a string. So I could say like read dot includes or include and, you know, we could see if like someone in there is named Jim or whatever and we get true back. So, you know, essentially this is just giving us a string with all the information in the file. There's also another uh, thing which we can do, which is called read line. And read line will basically read a line from the file. So if I print out file.read line, it's gonna read the first line of the file. But what this is actually gonna do is it's gonna read the first line and then it's basically gonna say like, okay, now we're on the second line. So let me show you guys what that means. So if I was to copy this line and paste it down here, this is gonna print out the first line of the file and then this one's gonna print out the next line in the file. So you'll see when I run this, it prints out Jim and then Andy. So Every time we read the line, we're basically telling the file that we want to move on to the next line. So this is a good way if you want to read like each line individually. You can also do the same thing, but with the characters. So I could say read char, and then down here, I could also say read char. And instead of reading the individual lines, this is just going to read the different characters inside the file one by one. So now we'll be able to print out Jim. Yeah. So rechar and readline can both be really useful like as you go through um, a file. And there's one more I wanna show you which will allow us to loop through all of the lines in the file and then for each line in the file we could like do a specific thing. So what I can do is I could actually say for line in file.readlines. And readlines is a little method which is basically just gonna return an array of all of the lines. So actually, let me show you guys uh, what this is going to give us. I'm going to print this out. So I'm going to print out file.readlines. And you'll see it's just printing out all the lines in the file, but this is actually stored as an array. So I could access, like if I wanted the third line in the file, then I'll be able to access it like that. So we can loop through this array like you would normally loop through an array. So we could say like for the line in file.readlines. And down here, we can just put some code that we want to do for each line. So, I mean, obviously I could just print them out. So I could say puts line, and this will print out every line. But in here, we could modify the line, we could look through it, we could do anything we wanted to each individual line in the file. And here's the thing, you know, these are just sort of the basics. You know, I mean, this is everything that you need to basically take a file, you know, a text file, loop through every line, and then you're basically just given a string. So this line over here, I mean, these are all just strings in our program. So, you know, you can use all the different string methods to parse through those lines, to figure out what they're saying, get information from them. Um, and, you know, really, it's honestly super easy to actually read from a file. So I would say that's all like the main, you know, those are sort of like the most popular, the most uh, commonly used methods when we're talking about files. I also do want to show you another way that we can open a file. So you see over here, we said file.open, the name of the file. And then we did this whole like do file thing. Um, uh, there's another way that we could actually do this. So instead of saying this stuff over here, I could actually just store this in a variable. So I could say like file is equal to all of this. And we can do exactly the same stuff we did before. So I could say like puts file.read and we'll still be able to print out all the contents of the file. The only thing with this though is whenever you create a file like this, you always want to make sure that you close the file when you're done with it. And closing the file basically means you're saying that you're done with the file. So you don't want to leave a bunch of files like open and in memory. So if you, you can just say file.close and this will go ahead and close the file and you won't have to worry about it like taking up any more space in your program. But that's really the basics and you know, you can really just sort of go from here, right? practice playing around reading different files, practice reading different types of files. These can be, they don't just have to be text files, they can be any type of file. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about writing to files in Ruby. One of the cool things about Ruby is we can read files, but also we can write files. So I could actually write information out to a file and I can do that right inside my program. So in the last tutorial, we talked a little bit about reading files. So we kind of opened up a file here. We opened up employees.txt, which was just this 
text file that had a bunch of like, I don't know, employees and a company in it. And we basically stored that file inside this file variable. We could do all sorts of stuff with it. Now I want to talk to you guys about actually writing information to files. And the first thing I want to kind of talk to you guys about are the different file modes. So different ways that we can open up a file. You'll see over here, I'm passing in two arguments to this open method. I'm passing in the name of the file, obviously. But then over here, I have this little R and this is basically a file mode. So this kind of tells Ruby like when we're opening the file, it kind of gives Ruby an idea of like what we want to be able to do with it, right? If I say R, this stands for read, but there's actually a bunch of other ones. So I'm gonna head over here to my web browser and I'm just on a Stack Overflow page. And I think this actually gives a pretty good explanation of all the different file modes in Ruby. So you can see here, R is basically just read only, starts at the beginning of the file. R plus is read write. Um, w is write only, it truncates the existing file. Uh, w plus is read write. So there's all these different like, file modes that we can open up. And this is a pretty cool list. You know, one thing that can be fun to do is just play around with a file and opening it in all these different modes just to kind of see what they do. In this tutorial, I'm gonna be opening the file in a couple of these different modes. And I think it's gonna be pretty fun. So the first thing I wanna show you guys is how to append to a file. So over here, I have my little list of employees, right? Let's say that I wanted to add an employee onto this file. And so I didn't want to modify any of the existing employees. I basically just wanted to append one to the bottom of the file. So we want to add in a new employee. Well, I can open up this file in what's called the append mode. So I'm just going to put an A here. And that basically means all we can do to this file is just add information onto the end of it. So we can't read from it. We can't write to it. Um, well, we can write to it, but we can only write at the end of the file. So we can just append something. So down here, what I could do is I could say file.write and inside of a parentheses, we can put whatever we want to write to the file. So why don't we try to add a new employee? So why don't we say we'll add Oscar who is in accounting. Basically what's going to happen is when I run this program, this line of text is going to get appended onto the end of the employees.txt file. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And now over here in the employees.txt file, you'll see we have this Oscar from accounting line but it actually just got appended right onto the end of the file. So literally right after the last character. And I wanna show you guys what we can do to mitigate that. So I'm just gonna get rid of that and we're gonna run this again. This time though, I'm gonna run it with a new line in front. And basically what this will do is it'll go onto the next line and then it'll print Oscar from accounting. So now when I run the program, we should get what we want, which is this. So Oscar is just on the next line. Um, here's the thing, when you're appending to a file or really when you're writing to a file, you need to be careful because if I was to run this program again, so I'm just gonna run it again, and I go back over to this employees.txt file, you'll notice that Oscar got appended to the end of the file again, right? So every time you run your program, it's gonna keep modifying the file. Um, so you need to be careful whenever you're writing to files because you're modifying the actual file. So if you, you know, mess up and you run your program one too many times, then your files are basically going to be, you know, if not ruined, they're going to have information in there that you didn't want. So that is the basics of appending. You can just append something onto the end of the file. It's super simple, super straightforward, and that can be really useful um, in a lot of different scenarios. Another thing we can do is just write to the file. So instead of A, I'm going to say W here. And this basically gives us the ability to modify information in a file, overwrite information in a file, and also create new files, which is pretty cool. So over here, if I was to say file.write, and I just did Oscar accounting, now what this is gonna do is it's gonna overwrite this entire employees.txt file. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna run this, and you'll see over here, this has actually overwritten the entire file. So we've overwritten everything in this file. And that's basically what happens when we write to a file. So I'm actually gonna undo this and we'll bring this back to how it was. I wanna show you guys another thing we can do, which is when you're writing to a file, um, you can actually create new files. So for example, let's say I wanted to create a new file. Um, I could actually come up here, put the name of the new file that I wanted to create. So maybe I'd wanna create like an HTML file. I could call it index.html. Down here, I could actually write out some HTML into this new file. So I could say file.write, and we can just put some, I mean, we can put like HTML, you know, whatever. So HTML is like another sort of programming language. And now what's gonna happen is when I run this program, 
a new file called index.html is gonna get created and this is actually gonna get written into that file. So you'll see over here, index.html has been created and it has a header one and it's just saying hello. So that's pretty cool. You can create all different types of files. You can use all different types of file extensions over here. And that's you know a really useful way to create files. Another thing I wanna show you guys is another file mode. So instead of just writing, we're actually gonna read and write. So I'm just gonna say R plus. And basically what this means is we can read the file and we can write the file. And when we're doing stuff like this, it makes it really useful. So, okay, so we have all of our employees here. I can actually use some of the read methods that we learned in the last tutorial and some of the write methods in order to write information at specific points in the file. So for example, we could insert text at a specific point in the file. So I could say like file.readline and this is basically gonna move to the next line in the file. So whenever you're reading a file, there's like something called a file cursor, um, or you'll hear people call it like the, the file buffer sometimes. Basically like it, when we open the file, we start at a specific place in the file. So if you come back over here, you'll see like read, read only starts at beginning of file, right? R plus read write starts at the beginning of the file. So in certain times when we use these certain modes, they'll start at, certain positions in the file, right? A little cursor or whatever. When I say file.readline, that moves that little cursor to the next line in the file, right? And so now, essentially where this cursor is, is at the second line of the file. So I could come over here and I could say file.write, and I could basically say like overridden. And now when I run this and I go over to my file, and actually we gotta change this back to employees.txt, my bad. So when I go back over to my file, you'll see that it says overridden down here, right? So I was able to override the text that was on that second line. I could even do the same just for parts of it. So if I just wrote out like high down here, you'll see that high is gonna get inserted only in these first two positions, right? So you're just overriding like the positions um, right after that little cursor. And so that can be really you know, useful. And really you can use this read line and there's also another one called read char. And read char will just read like an individual character. So it'll move that cursor like one character. You can use these different functions to move that cursor around the file and insert text you know, in very specific places. And that, you know, you can just kind of play around with that to be able to do stuff like that. But I would say those are kind of the basics. You know, we learned how to create new files. We learned how to override existing files. We learned how to insert text into specific places and specific files. Um, and we learned about the different modes. So again, you know, go off research some of the different modes where you can open a file. But I would say really writing to files is extremely useful. And there's a lot, lot, lot of programs that do stuff like this and rely on stuff like this. In this tutorial, I want to talk to you guys about exception handling in Ruby. Now, sometimes when you're writing your Ruby programs, you're gonna come across certain errors. So a lot of times when we get an error in Ruby, it'll crash our program. In fact, every time we get an error in Ruby, it's going to crash our program. And sometimes when you're writing Ruby code that you want to be able to execute for you know months and months or even like a couple years at a time, you wanna make sure that you're able to handle any errors or exceptions that pop up in your program. And I'm gonna show you guys how you can do that today using something called a rescue. So let's go ahead and trigger an error in our program. One of the easiest ways to do this is to divide something by zero. So if you're familiar with uh, you know math, you can't actually divide something by zero. So if I said like num is equal to 10 divided by zero, when I run this program, you'll see over here, we're getting a bunch of red, we're getting an error. It says divided by zero, zero division error. So Ruby's telling us you had a zero division error, right? Um, another error that we could use, and I'm actually just gonna comment this guy out right here, would be uh, trying to access an invalid index in an array. So we could try to access an array index using something like a string. So I just have this array over here of lucky numbers. If I was to say like lucky nums like zero, this is gonna be fine. This will give me this four. But if I said lucky nums dog, I can't actually pass a string into here. So I'm gonna get another error. And over here it says no implicit conversion of string into integer. So I'm getting a type error. 
And there's a bunch of these different errors in Ruby, you know, that handle a bunch of different situations going wrong. But the point is that if a situation like this comes up in my program, a lot of times I'm going to want it to not break the program. Like I'm going to not want it to explode the program and then, you know, the program is done running. So we can actually watch out for some of these common errors and we can do what's called catching them. And when we catch an error or we catch an exception, that means we're basically saying to the program like, hey, we know something went wrong, but we're handling it and it's all good. Don't worry about it. You don't need to crash and burn. So I'm going to show you guys how you can do that. And really the most basic way to do it is um, just to use something called rescue and begin tags. So over here, I'm just going to say begin and down below here, I'm going to say rescue. And then down here, I'm going to say end. So this is the basic structure. Any code that I think is going to throw an error or an exception in my program, I want to put it inside of these, this little begin block. So for example, this division by zero, let's grab this and we can put this in here. As long as this code, like the code that we think might break is inside of that begin block, then if something does go wrong here, then it's basically just going to go down to the code inside this rescue block and execute that. So I can say down here, like puts division by zero error. So now when I run my program, instead of the program just exploding, it's going to say division by zero error. So the program actually didn't break. The program didn't stop executing. Our program just handled the error and defaulted down here and basically printed out, hey, there is a division by zero error. Here's the thing. The same thing is going to work for these lucky numbers. So if I was to grab this lucky numbers and I put this over here and I'm actually going to comment this out. Now, when I run this program, you'll see that the lucky numbers is going to do the same thing. So over here, it says division by zero error. Here's a problem though. Let's say I have more than one piece of code inside of this begin block that has the potential to break the program, right? So these two blocks of code will break the program, right? We, we know for a fact that they will. But let's say that they'll only break the program some of the time, right? So maybe we have a program where the user can enter in two numbers to divide and sometimes they're going to enter into zero, in which case we're going to have to handle this error. And maybe sometimes they won't. The problem is that if I just put division by zero error down here, this is just going to catch any error that gets thrown. So it'll catch this error up here. It'll also catch this error. And remember, those are two different types of error. One was a division by zero error. One was a type error. So there's actually a way that we can specify specific rescue blocks for specific types of errors. So for example, that division by zero, if I wanted, I could come down here and I could say rescue, and then I can just type out zero division error. And remember, this is basically the error that got thrown when we divided by zero. And so here's the thing. When I run this num 10 divided by zero thing, it's going to get caught by this division by zero error when I run the program. But if I was to run this lucky numbers, so if I just uncommented this, this isn't going to get caught. So this is still going to break the program. You'll see over here, we're still getting a type error. So actually what I could do is I could create another rescue block for that specific type of error. And we could just say type error. And then down here inside of this rescue block, we could, you know, print out a message like wrong type. And so now this lucky numbers with the dog index is going to get caught and it's going to say wrong type. So a lot of times in Ruby, you're going to want to be specific about what errors you want to catch. And so basically what this means is in the case of a zero division error, I could do something. I could put a bunch of code inside of here. That's going to do something in the case of a type error. I could do something else. Another thing we can do is we can actually take the error that got thrown and we can store it in a variable. So I could say type error and equal sign and a greater than sign. And then I could just type in the name of a variable where I want to store the exception that got thrown. So I'm just going to call it E and down here I could actually print out E. So when this type error gets called, instead of just typing out, Hey, wrong type, it's going to tell us what the actual error was. So it says no implicit conversion of string into integer. And a lot of times this can be useful because different situations will cause this type error to run. In other words, like different stuff up here might cause the type error. So by storing the error inside of a variable called E and printing it out, we can tell the user exactly what went wrong.
So that's pretty useful. And this is optional. You don't have to do this, but a lot of times you're going to want to. And it's usually a good practice if you're writing a, a script or a piece of code that's going to be running for long periods of time. For example, if you need a piece of code to be running for like a couple months or like even a couple years at a time, like on some server somewhere, using these rescue tags is extremely useful because you'll basically prevent your program from terminating or prevent your program from blowing up when stuff goes wrong. Um, and just one more thought on this and, you know, different people have different opinions about this, but generally it's a good idea to specify the specific errors that you want to catch. Um, it's usually not a good idea just to use rescue. The problem is because this is just going to catch any error under the sun. And so a lot of times like you're going to want to be able to respond to individual errors differently. So this is kind of like almost too broad in a sense because you're just casting a huge net and catching every error in your entire program. But if you want to use that, then it's available to you. So that's the basics of using those begin and rescue tags in order to stop our programs from blowing up. In this tutorial, I want to talk to you guys about classes and objects in Ruby. Now, classes and objects are an extremely important concept in Ruby. So in this video, I'm going to be giving you a basic overview of what a class is, what an object is, how we can create classes, and how we can create objects. So make sure you pay attention because this is a very important topic when it comes to Ruby. Now, Ruby is an awesome language because it allows us to use all different types of data inside of our programs. So if you watched the video that I did on data types in Ruby, we looked at some of the basic data types that Ruby gives us. Things like strings, uh, integers, floating point numbers, things like booleans, um, and even like the nil value, right? There's all these different types of data that we can represent and we can work with and we can use in our Ruby programs. But here's the problem, is not all things, not all information, not all objects, not all entities in the real world can be represented by just those pieces of information, right? You can't represent everything with just a string or with just a number or with just a Boolean, right? There's a lot of things in the real world, like a lot of you know different things like a person or a phone or a credit card or a water bottle or a computer, a keyboard, a mouse. Like there's a lot of these real world things that can't be represented using just a string or just a number. And one of the cool things about Ruby is it allows us to create our own data types. So I could actually create my own data type that it would allow me to represent like a phone inside of my program, or that would allow me to represent a computer or a credit card or a book or a lampshade or a dog, really anything I would want, I could represent inside of my program and I could essentially just create my own data type. And essentially what that is, it's called a class. So we can create a class in Ruby and a class is basically just a custom data type. So it's a data type that we can define. So I can basically say like, I want to represent a book inside of my program. And I can say, here's what a book looks like in my program. Maybe it has like a title, it has an author, it has like, a, you know, a certain number of pages associated to it. And then I can take that book data type and I can create individual books from there. So I can take this book class that we're going to create and I can create individual books. I can represent individual books inside of my program. So I'm going to show you guys how we can do that. We're going to create a book data type or a book class, and then we're going to create some book objects. So this is going to be pretty cool. In order to create a class, I can just come over to my Ruby file and I'm just going to type out class and now I want to give it a name. And generally in Ruby, when we create a class, you're going to want to give it a name with a capital letter. So I could say like B O O K with capital B, and then I'm going to come down here and just type end. So remember a class is essentially a custom data type in Ruby. So when we create a class, we're basically modeling a real world entity or a real world object inside of our program. So inside of this book class, I'm basically telling Ruby what a book is. I'm defining like, here's what a book is. And generally when we create a class, we're going to give these classes various attributes. And that's how we can create a data type. I can say, okay, here's my book class. And every book is going to have a title. It's going to have an author and it's going to have a number of pages, right? A class is essentially like a blueprint or a template for a specific entity or object in the real world. 
Like a book is an actual entity in the real world, right? A book is an object that we can interact with and work with. And this class is a template or a blueprint for representing a book inside of our program. We're basically creating our own data type. So inside of this book class, I can actually define a bunch of attributes. And attributes is just gonna be information that all books are gonna have. So we're essentially telling Ruby like, hey, all books should have the following information. So inside of this class, I'm just gonna type out ATTR underscore A-C-C-E-S-S-O-R, attribute accessor. And now I'm gonna make a space, and over here I'm gonna type in the attributes that a book should have inside of our program. So I'm just gonna type a colon, and I'm gonna type the name of the attribute I wanna define. So all books should have a title, I'm gonna put a comma, books should have an author, and then books should also have a number of pages. So I'm just gonna say pages. So essentially what I'm doing here is, again, I'm laying out the blueprint for a book inside of my program. So I'm essentially saying like, here's the book data type and all books are gonna have a title, they're gonna have an author, and they're gonna have pages. So this is like our overall blueprint, our overall template. So now that we've created this, now that we've told Ruby what a book is, we can actually go and create individual books inside of our programs. And these are called objects. And an object is essentially just an instance of a book or an instance of a class. So I could create a book object and that book object would represent an individual book in my program. So I'm gonna come down here and you can create objects essentially the same way that you create variables. And actually, as we'll learn, all variables in Ruby are actually just objects. So I'm gonna give this a name. So we'll just call this book one, and I'm gonna set it equal to book.new. I'm gonna make an open and close parentheses. Basically what this is doing is it's telling Ruby that we wanna create a new book. So we want to create an actual book inside of our program. In other words, we wanna store the book data type inside of this book one variable. Now down here, what I can do is I can actually give this book attributes. So remember, we defined a book up here that it's gonna have a title, an author, and a number of pages. So down here, I can basically say book one dot title is equal to, and we can make this like a Harry Potter book, right? So I'm basically defining what the title of this book is. And down here, I could say book two dot author, and we'll make the author JK Rowling. And we can say, and actually, whoops, this has to be book one, I'm sorry. And then we can say book one dot pages, and we can set this equal to like, I don't know, maybe it has 400 pages or something. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating this book object. And remember, an object is an instance of a class. So an, a book object is basically just like a given book inside of our program that's gonna have all of these attributes. And I'm giving it all of these different attributes. I'm assigning it some information. So what I can actually do now is I can interact with this object. So I could say puts book one dot title, and this is gonna print out the title of book one onto the screen. You see over here, it's printing out Harry Potter. Over here, I could print out book one dot pages, and it's gonna print out all of the pages in book one, so there's 400, and we could do the same with the author. So essentially what I did was I created my own data type up here. I created a template for what a book is inside of our program. I said the book is gonna have these certain attributes. I created a new instance of a book, so I created a book object, and then I gave all of those attributes specific information. So I said like the title of book one is gonna be Harry Potter. The author of book one is gonna be JK Rowling. And what's cool about objects is we can create as many of them as we want. So, so down here, I could actually create another book. I could say book two is equal to book.new. And then I can start giving this some attributes. So I could say like book two.title is equal to Lord of the Rings. We could say book two dot author is equal to Tolkien and book two dot pages is equal to, let's say 500. So now I'm actually representing another separate book inside of my program. So I can come down here and say like puts book two dot author. And this is gonna print out the author of book two over here in the console. 
So essentially what we did again was we defined the template for what a book is going to be inside of our program. And this is a class. And then we can create instances of that class, which are called objects. And an object is just like an actual book. So we have the Harry Potter book. And we also have the Lord of the Rings book down here. And we can access all of the attributes from inside those books by saying book2.author or book2.pages. We can just refer to them directly. And that's one of the cool things about classes and objects. Is they allow you to create your own custom data types inside of Ruby. And one of the cool things about Ruby is that everything, all data is actually classes and objects. So all data is actually an object. A string is an object. An integer, like a number, is an object. A floating point number is an object. A Boolean is an object. All of these different things are objects and they all have classes which define them. That's really one of the cool things about Ruby and one thing that sets it apart from a lot of other programming languages is that everything is an object. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about the initialize method in Ruby classes. So in the last tutorial, we looked at creating Ruby classes and then creating objects of those classes. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you a way that we can actually make creating these objects a little bit easier. So you'll notice down here when I created my two book objects, I said book one is equal to book.new, and then I had to manually set the book's title, the book's author, and the book's pages. So just to create one book, I had to type out four full lines of code, right? And down here, I had to do the same thing. So when I created the second book, had to type out four full lines of code. And this is kind of a problem because if I wanted to create, for example, like, you know, 10 or 20 different books, it's gonna take up seriously a lot of space inside of my Ruby files. Also, just having to go through and manually say like book one dot title is equal to Harry Potter and book one dot author, like, that gets really tedious after a while. There's actually a way that we can give our objects all this information right up front when we create them instead of having to do it manually like this. And that's by using something called an initialize method. An initialize method is actually a method that's gonna get called whenever we create an object. So remember, up here we have this class. And this class is basically just a template, it's a blueprint for what a book is in our program. When I create an object, it stops being a template, it stops being a blueprint, and it becomes an actual book. So this book one object down here is representing the Harry Potter book, you know, with the author of J.K. Rowling and 400 pages. This is like a physical book that we used that template up there to create. So when we end up creating a book, we can actually give it some default information. And I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. So up here in our class, I want to create a method and it's going to be called initialize. So I'm just going to say def and it's initialize just like that. And I'm actually going to create this just like I would a normal method. So I'm going to say n down here. Inside of these parentheses, I can actually pass some information. But before I do that, I want to show you guys what's going to happen. So for example, I could put a print statement here. Actually, let's do a put statement and it's going to say creating book. Now, when I run my program, you'll see that over here, it actually types out creating book twice. Essentially what's happening, when I say book.new, this initialize method up here is getting called. So every time I use this new method down here and I call it, this initialize method is actually getting called. So if I was to pass a parameter into here, so let's have this initialize method take a parameter, like we'll have it take name, I could come over here and I could basically print out like, hello, name. So I could pass a name into here. I could say like Mike, and then down here I could say another name like Bill or whatever. And when I run my program, you'll see it's printing out hello Mike and hello Bill. So this is essentially just a method that we can call just like any other method in any of our programs. But this method's special because it gets called when we create an object. So what we can do is we can actually pass this initialize method some information and we can use that information to give our object specific information. So essentially what I can do over here is I could say initialize is going to accept three parameters. So when we call this new method down here, we're going to have to pass it three things. The first thing we're going to have to pass it is the title of the book that we want to create. 
The second thing we're going to have to pass it is the author of the book we want to create. And the third thing is going to be the number of pages for the book that we want to create. So now whenever I want to create a book, I have to give it a title, an author, and a number of pages. Once I'm inside this initialize method, I can do something special. So I can actually take the values that the user passed in. So I can take the title, the author, and the pages, and I can assign them to the attributes of the object. So I can assign them to the title of the object, the title of the author, and the title of the pages. I can basically do what I did down here. So I can basically say like book one dot title is equal to whatever the title they passed in was. And this is going to save us tons of time when we're writing our programs. And the way that I can do that is I can, I can just say at and I can say title is equal to title. So let me walk you guys through this line of code. When I say at title, this is referring to the title attribute in our object. It's referring to the title attribute that we defined up here. Is referring to that title up there, right? This is saying the title of the object that we're creating is going to be equal to the title that the user passed in. Remember this title, this is just a parameter that got passed into this new method down here. This is just a parameter, just like I passed in the name, it's the same thing. We're passing it a parameter. Um, and I, I could even name this something else. I could name this like, you know, I couldn't, I can name it, you know, whatever I wanted. And, and, but I'm just calling it title because that's what it is. It's the title. So I'm setting the title of the object equal to the title that got passed in. And I can do that for all of these. So I can say the author of the object is going to be equal to the author that got passed in. And the number of pages is going to be equal to the number of pages that got passed in. And so essentially what I can do now is when I create my new book, instead of having to say like book one dot title, book one dot author, I can just take all of this information and put it up here. So I can pass it into this initialize method. So I can just say Harry Potter, and this is gonna be JK Rowling, and then the number of pages is just gonna be 400. So I can actually get rid of all of this code over here because I don't need this anymore. And I can do the same thing for this other book down here. So we'll pass in Lord of the Rings, Tolkien and 500 pages. And I can actually just get rid of all of this stuff. So now instead of having all that other stuff, like where I had to like manually set each of those attributes, I can reduce the lines of code I have to write down to two. And this is going to do exactly the same thing as we were doing before. So I could come down here and I could, you know, print out like book two dot title, and it's still going to be able to print it out. So you'll see it's printing out Lord of the Rings. I could print out book one dot author, and it's going to be able to print that out. So I'm doing exactly what I was doing before, except now I'm making it a lot easier on myself by using this initialize method. And again, whenever we say like book dot new, this means we're calling this initialize method. We're passing it some parameters and I'm setting the attributes of the current object equal to the attribute that we pass in when we create that object. So that's how we can use that initialize method to make our lives way easier. And you're always going to want to use an initialize method for the most part, just because it makes everything so convenient. In this tutorial, I want to talk to you guys about instance methods in Ruby. Now, sometimes you'll hear people call these instance methods. Uh, you'll also hear people call them object methods. Sometimes you'll even call them class methods. Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to come inside of a class that we create in Ruby and we're going to give it some methods. And then when we're using objects of that class, we can access those methods to get information about our objects. So I want to show you guys my setup over here. I actually have a class here called student. And this class is basically just modeling or it's acting as a blueprint or a template for a student in our program. Essentially, we created like a student data type. So I defined the attributes for a student to be name, major, and GPA. And down here we have this initialize method. So we're passing it a name, a major, and a GPA. And we're setting the attributes of this student object of an individual student object to be equal to what gets passed in. So this is like our student class. And down here I'm creating two student objects. So we're making one, his name is Jim, he's studying business. He has a GPA of 2.6. Then we have Pam who's studying art and her GPA is 3.6. So these are student one and student two. 
Now imagine that for each of the students in our program, we wanted to be able to figure out if they had honors or not. So imagine you're writing a program for a college or university, and you wanted to be able to figure out whether or not a particular student had honors. Let's say that the rules for honors would were constantly changing, right? So one day maybe you had honors if you had a GPA over 3.5, and maybe then they you know would change it to be like 3.3. In other words, like imagine if we wanted to be able to find out which students had honors and which didn't. Well, we can actually write a method inside of our student class, and then that method will be able to tell us whether or not a specific object has honors. So I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. Over here in our class, I'm just gonna come down here below this initialize method, and we can actually create a method of our own. So I'm gonna go ahead and define a method, and I'm just gonna call this has honors. And this method is not gonna take in any information, so we're not gonna need open and closed parentheses, and down here we're just gonna end it off. So, this has honors method is basically gonna return either true or false. If the current student, if the object that's calling this method has honors, it'll return true. If they don't, it's gonna return false. So, how can we figure out if the student has honors? Well, we could use an if statement, so I could say if I wanna to check to see if the student's GPA is greater than or equal to a specific number. So what I can do is I can actually access the GPA attribute inside of our student object and use it here. So I could say if at GPA is greater than or equal to, and let's say that in order to have honors, we, we have to have a 3.5 or above. So if their GPA is greater than or equal to 3.5, then we're gonna return true. Otherwise, we're just gonna return false. So this is basically our method. If the GPA is greater than 3.5, we return true, otherwise we return false. So now what I can actually do is I can use this has honors method on each one of my student objects. So I could come down here and you see I've created these two students, right, Pam and Jim. If I wanted, I could print out whether or not they have honors. So I could say puts and let's check to see if student one, which is Jim, has honors. So I could say student one dot has honors. And when I run this, it's gonna print out whether or not he has honors. So in our case, it's gonna be false. But if I ran this method on student two, so if I ran this method on Pam, Pam actually does have honors because she has a 3.6. So now this is gonna return true. And what I wanna point out is this has honors method is gonna be different Depend, or it's gonna be using different information depending on what object is calling it, right? So when student one, when Jim is calling this object, Jim has a GPA less than 3.5, so it's gonna return false for Jim. So for the Jim object, for the Jim instance, it's gonna return false. But for the Pam object, Pam's GPA is higher than 3.5, so it's gonna return true we can basically define a method that can be used on all of the objects for our specific class. And we can do it using something like this. So you can define as many of these as you want inside of your class, and these can be really useful. A lot of good classes out there in Ruby are gonna have a bunch of good methods like this, which are gonna allow you to you know, either find out information about the specific object, or you know, modify the object, or do something to the object in some way, shape, or form. So, that can be really useful and just consider, you know, writing some methods inside of your classes when they're appropriate. This is a good example of, you know, where a method can come in handy because it can tell us whether or not the student has honors. It can tell us something about the student using the attributes, using the information that we've stored about that object. In this tutorial, I want to show you guys how we can create a multiple choice quiz in Ruby. So we're gonna use some of the stuff that we've learned so far in this course, like classes, we're gonna use loops, we're gonna use variables and if statements in order to create a multiple choice quiz. Basically, we're gonna be asking the user a series of questions. The user is gonna input whatever answers they think are correct, we'll grade the test, and we'll tell the user how they did. So this is gonna be pretty fun. First thing I wanna do is talk to you guys about some stuff that I already have set up. First thing I did was I wrote out a few questions for our multiple choice test. Down here I have P1, P2, and P3, and these are all basically prompts. So this is what we're gonna prompt the user with, and we're gonna ask them the question. So over here it says, what color are apples, red, purple, or orange? 
What color are bananas, pink, red, or yellow? What color are pears, yellow, green, orange? So this is a really easy multiple choice test, just asking about the colors of different fruits. Over here, I've defined a class called question. And this is basically modeling a question in our program. So I've essentially created like a question data type. And down here we have these attribute accessors. So we're defining a question has a prompt and an answer. So the prompt is basically what we're asking the user. So it would be like, for example, all these questions down here. And then the answer is the actual answer to the question. So like we're giving them a prompt that has a bunch of different options, multiple choices. The answer is going to be like what the actual answer is. And then we have this initialize method, which will just initialize the uh, object. So we can create like questions inside of our program now. So what I want to do is I want to create an array of questions and we're going to have one question for each of the prompts that we have up here. So I'm actually just going to create a, an array. We're going to call it questions and I'm just going to set it equal to uh, a bunch of different questions. So actually inside of this array, we can create a couple different questions. So I'm going to say question dot new and I'm going to create this first question. So remember, we need to give this a prompt and we need to give it an answer. So for the first question, I'm going to pass it P1 as the prompt because this is the prompt for the first question. And I want to give it the answer. So the answer to what color are apples is going to be a red. So I'm just going to pass in an A. Now I can create another question. So you'll notice over here, I can just create a question by saying question dot new, and then I can pass in the initial information. So I'm going to say question dot new, and now we'll make one for P2 for that second prompt. It says what color are bananas? And the answer is going to be C yellow. So we'll put a C inside of here. And finally, we'll make another question and this is going to be P3 and the answer to what color are pears is going to be B green. So we're going to go ahead and put a B in here. Essentially what I've done is I've created three questions in my program and I've stored them inside of this array called questions. So we have an array that stores all the questions for our test. Now the next step is we need to actually be able to run the test. So. What I want to do is I want to be able to go through each of the questions in the test. I want to be able to ask the user the question. I want to be able to get their answer and I want to figure out whether or not they got the answer right. So what we can do is we can actually create a method. So why don't we create a method that will run the test? So this method will accept one parameter, which is going to be an array of questions. It will use those questions to run the test. And it'll basically like ask the user all the questions, figure out what their answers were and score and grade the test. So let's do that down here. I'm going to create a method and we're just going to call it run test. And this method is going to take one parameter. So it's going to be an array of questions. So we could say questions and we're just going to call the parameter that we pass in questions and we can go ahead and end off this method. Now inside of this method, we want to do a few things. The first thing we want to do is basically just loop through and ask the user all the questions. So what I want to do is create a variable called answer. And I'm just going to set this equal to the empty string initially. And what we're going to do is we're going to store all of the users answers inside of that answer variable. So like we'll store, you know, the answer to the first question, the second question, the third question, etc. Now what we want to do is we want to loop through all of the questions inside of this questions array. So I'm going to create a loop. I'm just going to say for question in questions. So for each question inside of this questions array, I want to do something. And down here, we'll just end this off. Now inside of here, essentially what I want to do is ask the user the question. So I'm basically going to say puts and I'm going to print out the prompt. So I can say puts question dot prompt. So remember, this is going to be an array of question objects and the question class has two attributes. It has a prompt and it has an answer. So essentially what I'm doing down here is I'm printing out the prompt for the current question that we're looping through. Once I've printed out the prompt, I can get the input from the user. So I can just say answer is equal to gets dot chomp. And this is basically just going to get whatever the user enters and it's going to store it inside of answer. Now, what we need to do is we need to be able to keep score. So we need to be able to keep track of how many questions the user gets right and how many they get wrong. So I'm going to create another variable up here called score and I'm going to set this equal to zero initially. 
And whenever a user gets a question right, we're gonna increment the score. So every time they answer the question correctly, score will get incremented and by the end of the, of the test, we'll be able to tell how many questions they got right. So down here, I wanna check to see if the answer that they gave is equal to the correct answer. So I can just say if answer is equal to, and now I wanna compare this to the answer to the question. So I can say question.answer. And remember, this is just another attribute from inside of that questions class. So down here, I'll just end this off. And if the answer is equal to question.answer, then I can basically just increment the score variable. So I can say score plus equals one, and that will increment the score. Now, finally, down here after this for loop, I'm just gonna print out how they did. So I'll say puts, and we'll basically just say like, you got however questions out of however right. So we'll basically be like puts, you got score out of, and now we're just gonna type out the total number of questions. So we can say questions.length. And this is just gonna tell us how many questions were inside of that questions array. So this is obviously a lot of code and you know this run test method is obviously a lot of code, but everything looks like it's right. So why don't we try to run this and we'll see how we do. So remember, whenever we're gonna get input from the user, we always wanna use the command prompt or the terminal to do that. So I'm gonna open up my terminal and I'm gonna go ahead and run this Ruby file. So I'm just gonna say Ruby draft.rb because that's the name of the file and we'll run this. And so actually, whoops, totally forgot. We have to call this run test method. So I didn't actually call this run test method. So I need to do that. So let's come down here and we're just gonna call it. So I'm just gonna say run test and we're just gonna pass in that questions array. So we're passing in the array of questions that we created up here, we're passing in this guy. And actually, you know what, there's one more thing we have to change. So down here, I'm printing out the score. I have to say dot to s. So we're converting the score into a string and we're gonna have to do the same down here. So I'll just say dot to s. And now that we have this, we can actually run our program from inside of the terminal. So let's go ahead and do that. So here in the terminal, I'm just gonna run this file. I'm gonna say ruby draft.rb. And you'll see it's asking us the first question. So it says, what color are apples? So let's just try to get them all right. I'm gonna say apples are A, red. What color are bananas? Let's say C, yellow. What color are pears? Let's say B, green. And so you can see here, once we entered in all the answers, it typed out, you got three out of three correct. So it's actually telling us how many of these we got correct. And that's pretty awesome. So let's try this again, but let's try to get some wrong. So I'm gonna run this same exact file and let's get the first one wrong, we'll say apples are purple. We'll get the second one wrong, we'll say bananas are pink. And we'll get the third one right, so we'll say pears are green. So now it's gonna say you got one out of three because we only got one out of three questions correct. So that's basically how we can build a little multiple choice test. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about inheritance in Ruby. Now inheritance basically allows us to extend the functionality of one class into other classes. So I can basically define uh, what we would call like a super class, and then I can create subclasses from that super class, which will inherit all of the methods, all the functionality, all of the attributes from that original super class. So if that doesn't make sense, don't worry. I'm gonna give you guys a full example of what this is and how it works. Um, but let me show you guys first what I have over here. So I created a class over here, which is called Chef. And this Chef class, I'm gonna expand it. It has three methods inside of it. So the first method over here is called Make Chicken. And this method basically just prints out the Chef Makes Chicken. And then it has a Make Salad method, same thing, prints out the Chef Makes Salad. And then finally we have the Make Special Dish method, which just prints out the chef makes barbecue ribs. So essentially we're just like creating a chef inside of our program. If I wanted, I could come down here and create an instance of the chef. So I could say chef is equal to chef.new. And now that I have my chef object, I could say like chef.make chicken. And now when I run my program, you'll see it says over here, the chef makes chicken. So we're telling the chef to make a chicken. We could tell the chef to make a salad or to make the special dish. Now, let's say that in addition to having this chef class, right, this general overall chef class, we also wanted to define another type of chef. We also wanted to model another type of chef in our program. 
So let's say that in addition to this generic chef, we wanted to create a, another, a more specialized type of chef. So we wanted to create an Italian chef. So I could say Italian chef. So we're creating an Italian chef class. And down here, we'll just end this off. But let's say that our Italian chef can do everything that our normal chef can do. So the Italian chef can also make chicken, can also make a salad, and can also make a special dish. So the Italian chef can do everything that the normal chef can do. In other words, the Italian chef can have all the same methods as the normal chef. Well, I can actually use something called inheritance and I can pass down all of the functionality from inside of this chef class into the Italian chef class. In order to do that, all I have to do is come down here and after I say the name of the class, I can just make a less than sign and I can just type out the name of the class that I want to inherit from. So when I say chef right here, that means that the, the Italian chef is going to inherit all of the functionality from this chef class. So it's essentially gonna inherit all of these methods. So let me demonstrate this. You'll notice there's nothing inside of this class. I didn't type anything inside of there. But I could come down here and I can create an Italian chef object. So I could just say Italian chef, chef.new. So I'm creating a new Italian chef. And then down here I can just say Italian chef.make salad. So even though I don't have any code up here inside of this Italian chef class, not a single line of code, I can create an Italian chef object and I can still tell this Italian chef to make salad. So now when I run my program, you see down here, in addition to the normal chef making chicken, we're also able to use the Italian chef to make a salad. So over here it says the chef makes salad. So this Italian chef object has access to all of the functionality from inside of the chef class because I inherited it. So I'm using inheritance here and I'm inheriting all the functionality from the chef class. But here's a question, right? The normal chef over here has a special dish so the normal chef makes a special dish and it says the chef makes barbecue ribs. But let's say that the Italian chef is gonna have a different special dish from the just generic chef. What I can do is I can actually do what's called overriding a method. So I can override the make special dish method inside of this Italian chef class. So I could actually say make special dish and we'll end it off and then inside of here, I can put what I want the Italian chef's special dish to be. So I could just say puts and we'll say like, the chef makes eggplant parm. So this is gonna be the Italian chef's special dish. So now if I was to come down here and say chef.make special dish and Italian chef.make special dish, you'll see when I print these out or when I run my program, it says, the chef makes barbecue ribs and the chef makes eggplant parm. So inside of the Italian chef class, I was actually able to override this make special dish method. And that is a super useful thing to do. Um, another thing I can do is add functionality into this. So let's say that the Italian chef, in addition to doing everything that the normal chef can do, can also make pasta. So I can make a method here, it's make pasta and down here, it's just gonna be the chef makes pasta. So now, inside of my Italian chef object, I can make some pasta. So I could say Italian chef dot make pasta, and the Italian chef will be able to make pasta. But the normal chef down here doesn't have a make pasta method, so it's not gonna be able to make pasta. So let's go over what we did. Essentially, I created this class chef. This chef had a bunch of functionality. It can make chicken, can make salad, can make a special dish, right? Then I created a, another class, Italian chef. And this Italian chef could do all the same stuff as the normal chef. So what I did was I inherited all the functionality from the chef class into here, right? But there was a circumstance where the Italian chef was actually gonna have a different special dish than the normal chef. So I overrode this method. I basically defined, redefined the method inside of the Italian chef class, and I was able to make it do what I wanted it to do. I also extended the functionality. So I was able to actually make the Italian chef different. So the Italian chef, in addition to doing everything that the normal chef could do, could also make pasta. And that's the basics of inheritance. We can define what's called a superclass. 
So this chef up here, this is the super class. And then we can also define subclasses. So this Italian chef is a subclass. And it's considered a subclass because it inherits from the chef superclass. And this can be really awesome. So a lot of times in Ruby, you're gonna have different hierarchies of classes. So we'll have like the chef class, and then we'll have a subclass, an Italian chef. I could also create other subclasses like a Chinese chef or a French chef or a Mexican chef, right? I could have different, you know, uh, types of chefs, different subclasses of chefs that would all inherit the functionality from the generic chef class. So that is super useful feature in Ruby. It's a really gonna come in handy, especially if you start creating lots and lots of classes. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you about using modules in Ruby. Now a module is basically just a container where we can store groups of methods. So as you start programming more and more in Ruby and as your programs get more and more complicated, you're gonna to wanna to organize all the different methods that you're using. So a lot of times in a Ruby script, you're gonna be writing out a bunch of different methods that are gonna do different things and you know, they'll have different tasks. And one thing we can do is we can take methods that are doing similar things or that should be grouped together and we can put them inside something called a module. So over here, I have this file open. It's called usefultools.rb. And in here, I've defined a module. So I'm just gonna open this up and you'll see inside of this module, I just said module and then tools. So whenever we create a module, you can create it by saying module. And generally, you're gonna wanna give modules a name with a capital letter. So you need to do that. And down here, uh, I have two methods inside of this module. I have a method called say hi, and it says hi to a user. And I have one called say bye, same thing. You give it a name and it says goodbye. So this is a very, very simple module. But the module is essentially just storing these methods inside of it. And this basically acts as a container for us to organize our methods and sort of keep them in a nice clean little container. So if I wanted to use the methods that were inside this module, the first thing I have to do is just come down here and say include. And now I just wanna type the name of the module. So I could say tools. Now, if I wanted to access the methods inside of the tools module, I could just say tools dot, and now I can type out the method name. So I could type out tools dot say hi, we could pass it my name, and now it's gonna say hi to me. So it'll say, hello, Mike. You can do the same thing for say bye. So I'm able to store these different methods inside of this tools module, and then I can access them just by referring to the name tools, and then the method name. So modules are useful for really two reasons. The first reason is because they allow us to organize our methods a lot better. So if you have a bunch of methods, you can put them inside of a module and then they're just sort of like organized in their own separate container. Uh, the other thing that makes these useful is we can use this name. So I can give a module the name and then I can basically say like over here, I want to call the say by method inside of the tools module, or I wanna call the say hi method inside of the tools module. It basically gives all of these methods, like it gives them a namescape. So this is the say by method inside of the tools module. It basically allows you to, you know, refer to these different methods um, inside of a particular namescape. And that can be really useful. So for example, I could have a say hi method inside of the tools module and I could have a say hi method inside of like another module and I'd be able to use both of them in the same program. So modules are extremely useful and this is how you can use a module in the same file. So I declared this module up here and I was able to use it in the same Ruby file. But a lot of times you're gonna want to use these modules in other files. So for example, I have this draft.ruby file over here. Imagine that I wanted to use all the functionality from the tools module inside of this file. I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. The first thing we need to do is we need to actually like require this file. So there's a keyword in Ruby, it's called require. And we can type out require and then we can type in the name of a file and we'll be able to basically like grab all the information uh, and bring it into our file. And actually there's a command called require relative and this is what I'm gonna use. Require relative will basically allow you to input a file name 
relative to the current file. So you notice over here in my file tree, I have this draft.ruby file open and Ruby tools or these this useful tools files in the same directory. So if I use require relative, I can just type out the name of that file. So I can just say useful tools.rb. And basically this is just like telling Ruby that we're gonna use something that's inside of this file. So we need to require it. And now what I wanna do is I want to include tools. So I'm gonna do the same thing we did over there in that other file, but just inside of here. So if we run this draft.rb file now, essentially we're going to have access to this tools module. So I could come down here and I could say tools dot say hi, and we could say like Mike, and now this is gonna run that tools module. But we didn't actually define the module inside of this file, we defined it over here. So this is something that's really useful in Ruby. You can basically define a bunch of these different modules and then you can include them into different files and you'll be able to use all the functionality inside of those modules. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about Interactive Ruby. Now, Interactive Ruby is basically a little application that we can run from the terminal or the command prompt, and it essentially allows us to test out and use different Ruby commands in a sort of sandbox environment. So, I'm gonna show you guys exactly what it is and how to use it. Um, the first thing you wanna do is open up your command prompt or your terminal. So if you're on Windows, open up your command prompt. If you're on Mac, open up the terminal. And I'm just gonna run this and I'm just gonna type in terminal. So now that I have my terminal open, in here I wanna make sure that I have IRB installed. So, sorry, IRB stands for Interactive Ruby. And this is the program that we're gonna be running. So what, all you wanna do is type IRB hyphen V, and this should spit out a version number. Now, as long as you have Ruby installed on your computer, you're probably gonna have IRB, but if you don't have IRB installed, so if you didn't get a version number for that, then just go online and you can look up, you know, how to install IRB. And here's the thing, it's not absolutely necessary for Ruby, so maybe just like watch this tutorial, see if it's something that you think you're gonna use, and then go off and download it, but if you have it, you should be able to follow along with me. So I'm just gonna type IRB, I'm gonna hit enter. And now you'll see that I get this little prompt with this uh, sort of like greater than sign. And essentially this is interactive Ruby. So this is the IRB. It's essentially like a little application that we can use and we can just test out little Ruby commands. So for example, I could create a variable, let's call it num. I could set it equal to 123. I'm just gonna click enter. And now I could test out a Ruby command. So I could say like puts one, two, three. And this is gonna go ahead and print out the number that was stored in the variable. So essentially you can execute any like valid Ruby commands from inside of the IRB. So I could create like a method and just, we'll just call it say hi. And down here you'll see now I can write whatever is gonna be inside the method. So I could say puts hello. And now we can end off the method. So I'm just gonna click end. And now I can actually like use that method. So I can do like say hi, and this is gonna say hello. So you can find methods, you can find variables, you can find all different types of stuff. Um, you could use things like if statements, or you could use, you know, while loops. You can use all the valid Ruby commands that you can normally use inside of a file, inside of this interactive Ruby. Um, and, but basically this is just an environment where you can go to test out you know, different functionality. You could test out a little uh, method, you could test out a function, and it's an environment where there's literally no setup required. So you don't have to like create a text file, you don't have to run the text file from the terminal. You can just go in here and try different things out and it's like very much like a sandbox environment. Now here's the thing, this is really good if you're just trying to like test certain things out or you know, see if something's gonna work. But generally, if you're gonna be writing like actual Ruby scripts or actually Ruby, actual Ruby commands, you wanna do that inside of a file. So this isn't a replacement for like writing code out in a file and like doing all that. This is a special environment that you wanna use basically for like testing purposes. But this can be really useful and a lot of times if you go online and you see like different Ruby tutorials, they'll be like using the interactive Ruby command line just because it's like so useful and so easy to set up. So really, I just wanted to kind of introduce you guys to this and expose you to it so you know what it is and like what it's doing. But I would say for the most part, you know, you should be writing your Ruby code inside of a text editor.